Assalamu alaikum, greetings and good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Hello everyone and welcome uh, to our University Kebangsaan Malaysia virtual seminar and also workshop uh, supported by Toshiba International Foundation and we are of Japan and we are very, very happy uh, to be a recipient of the Toshiba International Foundation um, grant where our task was to actually establish a series of webinars uh, with regards to the topic of internationalization. So we at UKM Global or the International Relations Center has been actively um, conducting webinars in the past uh, few months. And we are hoping uh, that some of you have actually participated in some of the webinars. Now in today's session or today's virtual seminar and workshop, we have decided to have a slightly more intimate approach, a smaller group of people where we can also have a group discussion at the end. We hope that the sessions that we will offer will be able to give some ideas or insights to all of you with regards to the issue of the new age of internationalization or the future of internationalization. Now, the past two years has been very, very challenging, especially for all of us dealing with internationalization. Being part of the International Relations Center, our task just change or got twisted overnight. Um, and in March 2020, when most parts of the world have actually practiced um, the um, lockdown, yeah, where the countries went into lockdown and there were barriers to travel and mobility, a lot of things changed. We discovered this uh, dependency towards technology, the need for international office and the university to be creative the need for academics to learn new ways of doing things, trying to, you know, Zoom became a buzzword. Now, over the past two years, we've actually been learning about what were some of our problems. But after two years, we need to look about sustainability. We need to look about continuity. We have given two years as a reason of us to adapt, to change, and to experience new challenges. But at the same time, um, we are now moving forward and we have to look at the future of internationalization. And the future of internationalization could be a different phase as what we've been used to. It requires new adaptability. It requires us to be a bit more agile. It requires us to be able to transform to new ways of doing things, to be able to understand uh, the challenges that happens as well. So just to share with all of you, now the objective for this um, virtual seminar and also workshop is actually uh, to create a platform for us to listen from the experience and also uh, the forward thinking of the, our Japanese counterparts. And today we have, uh, we are very, very honored to have four distinguished speakers from Japan who are um, in a way experts in the field of internationalization and have done innovative ways of adapting to the new way of internationalization as well. And we'll be introducing them shortly after this. But aside from that, I would like to share a bit with regards to University Kebangsaan Malaysia's role in promoting um, internationalization through the cooperation, through the support of Toshiba International Foundation. Now, how we see over the past few years, it has been um, 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 a lot of us had to adapt to new ways of doing things. Now, but one exciting thing to look at is that the webinar series that we've organized for the six um, series that we've had were initially planned towards a physical seminar. And when we applied for the grant, it was supposed to be a physical seminar, but then things had to change and we adapted. And we did six different webinars with regards to internationalization. And it was, alhamdulillah, it was well accepted with well positive reviews and also participation. Yeah. Now, um, with regards to our UKM Global Webinar Series, we've actually organized six global series before this. And among the topics that were there included the international experience of higher education institutions in Japan and Malaysia. Secondly, is transdisciplinary education and the growth of global citizens. Thirdly, we've also had one on international virtual learning engagements 
understanding concepts, strategies, and executions. We also got the importance of associations in the internationalization strategies of universities. We've also had a topic on embracing language and culture through internationalization. And lastly, we've had a group of students to come and speak on the international mobility experience of students from Malaysian and Japanese universities. So with these topics, the excitement of sharing with it, we had our experts, not only from Japan, uh, but also from Malaysia, uh, representatives of International Relations Office, um, maybe deans and deputy deans, and also our deputy vice chancellor of UKM had, and USM had also participated in the past events, and they were sharing their experiences and insights. So what we have here today is the way to move forward, the way to look at what the future will bring for us. And today, we are honoured to have four distinguished speakers, Professor Hiroshi Ota of Hito Tsubashi University, Tokyo, Japan. We've also got Professor Dr. Keiko Ikeda from Kansai University, Japan. And we've also got Professor Akiyoshi Yonizawa from Tohoku University, Japan, and Professor Nakao Nomura from University of Tsukuba, Japan. I welcome all of the participants here today and we've got over 66 participants at the moment. We want to keep it small, intimate, so that this discussion at the end by the participants would be very, very conducive. And you know, we, create, um, we allow a platform for you to discuss and talk about your experience and insights to one another. Now, um, we, I guess we are quite ahead of time. And I've noticed that Professor Hiroshi Ota is already here. Professor Hiroshi Ota? Let me just get, yeah. Yes. Uh, hello, Professor Hiroshi. Oh. Yes. Today, we would just like to inform you that we've got a number of participants from the Southeast Asian region. Mm -hmm. And we've also got um, some participants from Malaysia, which consists of International Relations Office and also from deans, deputy deans dealing with international affairs. Um, and also some students as well who has participated in mobility during the changing period. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Hiroshi Ota. But prior to that, on the screen, um, the Secretariat team will be showing the bio data of Professor Hiroshi Ota, who is known for his work in internationalization um, in Japan and also his experience in promoting internationalization of Japanese universities across the world. I now pass you the floor, Professor Hiroshi Ota. Thank you very much. Thank you for introducing me, uh, Chair. Uh, it's um, very nice to, to participate in this uh, um, seminar. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, okay, let me, may I start my presentation? Yes, please do, yeah, thanks. So the slide show is okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, Looks um, great. very visible. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, uh, my name is Hiroshi Ota. I work for Hitotsubashi University. Maybe it'd be difficult to pronounce it. <laughs> Hitotsubashi meaning is a uh, one bridge in, in Chinese character. One bridge is not a Cambridge, but one bridge in Tokyo. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Today's my um, topic is uh, planning and then strategizing the internationalization, a new era. So um, first I want to kind of review what's really happening in the internationalization of higher education. So um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, the internationalization of higher education and the international uh, higher education focused mainly on international student mobility, uh, which underwent a quantitative uh, expansion. However, in the wake of the COVID-19 uh, disaster, cross-border student mobility has been largely suspended and the various international education practice using ICT are rapidly spreading as an alternative to international student mobility programs. So, um, 
the COVID-19 crisis, actually, I feel uh, it's kind of opportunity um, for the uh, pre existing problems that become more apparent um, that's uh, done before. So um, as I mentioned, those uh, internationalization, heavy D on, uh, rely on the mobility and also increasing carbon emissions generated by student air travel. That was also pointed out before COVID-19 and then, but become yeah, more people aware of this problem. Um, how can university cope with this situation and adapt to the new normal or new era with continual risk of infectious disease and also geopolitical issues? So this uh, diagram shows uh, those international recruitment targets, uh, national strategy for international education as a study abroad uh, destination. So when you see that many countries, they set the goal to attract the number of a number of international students. Malaysia is also included, Japan is there, uh, Germany also um, uh, accomplished this target number two years ahead. <clears throat> um, and also now UK also renewed uh, uh, the, their target number and then, uh, and then achieved quickly. So, um, in Japan, um, academic programs that have compulsory study abroad have attracted many high school students before, but now it's uh, regarded as a high risk program. And uh, in the uh, unprecedented situation caused by COVID-19, most of these universities have started to utilize ICT to continue international exchange and learning, learning virtually. One of the most common practice is encouraging students to participate in short-term online programs offered by university abroad that are typically a few weeks long. Uh, in addition to such program, um, one or two semester long virtual, virtual mobility programs, they are alternatives to traditional uh, mutual student exchange programs with partner university ab abroad. In this form, exchange students do not travel abroad, but still take online courses offered by partner universities abroad. Some universities have uh, developed an online platform system for virtual student mobility in collaboration with partner universities abroad. So also uh, virtual mobility programs provided by uh, international consortium of universities, uh, universities. Uh, for instance, the APRU, APRU Association of Pacific Rim University and the UMAP University Mobility in Asia and the Pacific offer such programs. So, and virtual mobility uses ICT to obtain the same kind of uh, similar benefit as one would have with uh, physical mobility, but without need to travel. So from my understanding, virtual mobility is kind of replacement or alternative for the physical mobility. On the other hand, uh, virtual exchange is defined as a technology or enabled people to people um, um, education program su uh, sustained over a period of time in which sustained, uh, sustained communication and in, uh, interaction takes place between individuals uh, or groups who are geographically separated with the support of um, facili uh, facilitators and uh, educators. COIL also uh, referred to as a global network uh, learning and the virtual exchange. is a new teaching and the learning parada uh, paradigm that promote the uh, development of intercultural um, competence across shared multicultural learning environment through the use of uh, internet-based tools and innovative online pedagogies coil fosters meaningful exchange between university level uh, teachers and the students with peers uh, in geographically distant location and form different uh, linga, uh, linga cultural background uh, branded learning combines face-to-face -face interaction with computer uh, mediated instruction. Um, instruction. 
Okay, uh, these are, so I feel that virtual exchange branded learning and the different from uh, virtual mobility as also these two diagrams show. Um, problems in international education caused by COVID-19 crisis. Um, according to our next Ministry of Education um, survey, according to the next survey, of 50 universities in 2020, the more than 90% of the university reported that they faced the difficulties in pursuing internationalization due to the massive cancellation of academic and student exchange programs caused by the pandemic. So 84% of those went, to, uh, went on to respond that the need to revise their internationalization strategy to respond to the post COVID-19 era was one of the challenges they faced. So these ICT-based education methods I mentioned, such as those v, uh, virtual mobility, virtual exchange, were practiced even before the pandemic. And they were not originally developed for uh, emergency and the crisis situations. Rather, the benefits and advantage of those methods were reaffirmed during the COVID-19 crisis and they are expected to prevail as the new modality for international education in the new normal situation. However, Japanese university, which have focused principally on face-to-face -face classes on campus, have lagged far behind other countries with a long history of distance education utilizing ICT. So one of the reasons cited for uh, this lack is the lack of staff with expert knowledge and the skills in ICT-based edu education. So now is in, also in Japan, the growing inequalities among university, universities regarding resources. Some have the uh, affluent HR and the finance uh, capacity to respond to, uh, respond to the crisis. On the other hand, they don't have the, they have a problem, they have a scarce uh, resources such to respond to the crisis. This is also another next survey. And then 80% of university answered that they would develop international exchange programs with branded learning, combining uh, physical mobility and uh, internet education. This also uh, saying that uh, makes those initial education um, uh, information, um, educational exchange via online and resetting the value of study abroad is now is an issue. So considering the quality assurance of education and the research, uh, online education still uh, we are question the quality of such education. And then also now is a time to need to redefine study abroad uh, because uh, IT, ICT based education is uh, prevailing. So, um, International partnerships also changing. In general, international partnerships are concentrated on, again, two-way semester-based student exchange and one-way short-term study abroad programs, short uh, study uh, mobility, student mobility programs. And COIL virtual exchange initiatives have attracted attention from university as a way of promoting sustainable and inclusive international learning without mobility and may change meaning and the state of international partnerships. So this is, I made this table. Uh, Left-hand side, international educational exchange through physical student mobility to the traditional kind of way. It, I call it its expansion approach, increase the number of partner institutions to provide more opportunities for students to participate. Uh, many uh, universities, they, they brag about uh, how many uh, partner university they have, 400 or 500. But I believe this becoming uh, uh, obsolete uh, because we're moving to more uh, ICT-based uh, exchange uh, program. Um, so the left-hand side, university or school-based approach, student exchange programs implemented under institution-wide what or sometimes departmental level MOUs. So both sides, uh, institution or schools or department, they sign MOUs. After that, University A send a student to uh, their student to University B. University B 
uh, send their student to University A. So they ex exchange students, but there are not much educational collaboration or cooperation. There are more system is kind of connected to the university. And then still, even they are increasing the number of partner institutions, still a very small number of students can actually participate in such exchange program. On the other hand, those uh, international exchange through ICT is a more, uh, you don't need so many uh, partner universities. So I call it concentration approach, uh, stratify partners, uh, existing partners, stratify existing partner and the conduct collaborative education with strategically important partners. So you don't need so many universities. You have to have a very strategic partner. And then more, it is a course uh, instructor based approach rather than uh, institutional based approach. Um, collaborative education requires trust building and the careful coordination and arrangement between instructors. That's why you can't have many partners, but you can approach to a large number of students. So um, I conducted the case study um, of the uh, good practice of international education using ICT. Uh, I um, interviewed extensively uh, two universities, one in national, one in private in Japan. And then we have found the four similar enablers of uh, uh, in two those good practices, uh, two cases. And the first one is that both institutions have a history of actively developing and expanding many international education programs before the pandemic. So, and they have taken a pride in um, playing a leading role in this field in Japan. This has driven them to take rapid action to continue an international educational exchange using ICT after the pandemic began. In contrast to the majority of Japanese universities that tend to consider starting online international education with little previous experience as a risk. On the other hand, two surveyed universities consider the wait and the C approach to be a more serious risk in the long run, as they might lose their momentum for promoting international education. So, the, how you perceive the risk is different for those advanced or good practice university and then on just wait and see approach majority of university in Japan. Seco second, the academic and administrative staff members from the leadership, executive board members to the frontline staff have shared the same objectives and the goals and each carried out their ex expected roles, thereby enhancing um, the sense of unity as an organized as an organization. Uh, another common enabler is a key bridging role of middle managers who are positioned between the leadership and the staff on the ground. So uh, international uh, education activity or internationalization, those top management the president's commitment is very important, but also equally important those frontline uh, people working on the front line and then also communication between them. The third, uh, the financial and then human resource were flexibly, uh, uh, flexibly and effectively relocated to online international education from mobility-based international education programs. And generally speaking, and also the prestigious university are not active in publicity and the public relations since they are already well recognized due to the, their prestige and enjoy a large applicant pool. However, active and effective publicity has not only increased the recognition of the newly developed online international education in society, but also contributed enhancing the motivation of the academic and the administrative staff working for online international education, increasing the consensus about the new initiatives throughout the campus and building a foundation for further development. University is a very unique organization, um, academic staff, administrative staff, student, their kind of um, um, purpose and then also goal is uh, quite different. So how you can uh, create a, um, a unification is, is very important. And that the, those publicity and then also uh, effective 
uh, or flexible uh, using the resources is very important. And the fourth, the two Saibed University are committed to using online international exchange as a new modality of international education in the post COVID-19 era, not just an emergency response to the pandemic or as an alternative to physical mobility programs. Compared to international education through overseas travel, ICT-based international education has an advantage of including a large number of students because it significantly reduces the time and the cost burden. Therefore, both university envision that the combination of international education through overseas travel and the one using ICT, such as branded learning, can more effectively provide students with international learning experience. However, still we face the challenges of those online international education. Um, online international education um, is, uh, as I said, can expand the range of the uh, participant, but there's a language barrier. Uh, Japan, uh, Japanese are less proficient in English, not only students, but also faculty and the staff, and also time zone differences. Also differences in the academic calendars. We have very unique calendars. Uh, it commences in April and in March, and also LMS also different uh, um, across the countries. And uh, also one of the challenges for Japanese higher education is to create the international curricula that are designed for both domestic and the international students and a common agenda, not only to provide equal uh, learning goals and opportunity, but also to enable all students to participate fully in the classes on offer while developing cross-cultural competences. Also such curricula should consider education for global knowledge society with an emphasis on the development of students' personal quality, qualities as responsible citizens, such as like a global citizen. Um, however, Japanese university traditionally provide those international intercultural opportunities through offering study abroad programs, relying heavily on their partner institution abroad, since their campuses and the local communities are not culturally diverse, pretty really homogeneous. So the increasing of use of ICT uh, international, in international education has made us re-examine re the value and the meaning of study abroad and the mobility programs. In the post-COVID-19 era, it expected that the various uh, issues brought about by pandemic will lead to significant change in this regard. So uh, study abroad will be seen as one of the various, various means to an end, not the uh, end itself. For, uh, but when we visit uh, the study abroad, the value of study abroad, <coughs> um, why do students need to go abroad for running? In the post-COVID-19 era, it is assumed that the value and the meaning of study abroad will be re-examined. Study abroad is valued since it gives students the international experience, not only of being abroad, but also of integrating into daily life in the host country. It is the experience of living and adjusting to a new language and culture that raise the participants' comparative awareness of the world through the host country's lens, while nurturing self-discovery and developing personal values and attitudes. Although its significance has remained largely the same, trends in study abroad participants have changed over time. For instance, this is a Japanese case. Uh, um, as I said, the, the, the significance or value of the study abroad has remained largely the same, but trend has changed. In, in Japan's case, since the 2000, the types and the purposes of study abroad have shifted from long-term degree-seeking study, um, study based on individual initiative to short-term short credit earning study abroad study supported by the government and universities. In line with this shift, 
more emphasis has been placed on the effect of short-term study abroad, such as broadening one's horizons and the challenge, changing one's life and the sense of values through unusual experiences abroad, rather than on the outcome of long-term study abroad, such as degrees and specialized knowledge and the skills. So that differences and the long-term degree seeking study abroad is more kind of result oriented. So you have a degree, you have a specialized knowledge, but the short-term um, study abroad is actually, this is a kind of, uh, uh, is a standard in industrialized country. Uh, it is, I would say more process oriented um, because those kind of unusual experience is sometimes maybe it's the first time for students to exposure themselves to the world. This is a kind of the beginning of to study new things. So it's, we expect more effect after short-term study abroad, students maybe to keep studying the, the many things in the world. In the world. But long-term case is more they're emphasizing on the degree and then specialized knowledge leading to the more uh, uh, career. So um, uh, long-term study abroad is, uh, as I said, it's more kind of standard in developing countries. It is more result oriented, but study abroad and uh, short term is a stand, standard in, uh, in industries country is more process oriented. Study abroad should be a means to an end, but there has, has been become an end itself, especially in the for short term program. So here I'm going to talk about last part. This is a future scenarios. So short term study abroad, um, programs will increasingly incorporate ICT-based education before traveling to and after returning from destination. So resulting in a uh, blended learning so that the overall duration of learning will become longer, even study abroad is shorter. So emphasizing learning outcome. Short-term study abroad programs will focus more on on-site experience-based learning, such as internship, volunteer work, service learning, field work kind of stuff. Short-term study abroad has an increase and opportunity starting kind of point to change one's life, life-changing experience often um, called and study abroad experiences, and the sense of value as, a, an, uh, and as an awareness. Studying abroad, um, then study abroad programs to learn foreign language will be declined in favor of ICT-based lang uh, language learning. I think this is good for, for the Japanese students, Japanese students or many countries, uh, uh, foreign language learning is uh, the ma uh, majority of study abroad, short-term study abroad, but now you don't have to go abroad, you can study at home. Uh, home. So, and then also next one, uh, international education through virtual exchange and the mobility will become the mainstream as awareness of environmental issues, in, in issues increase and the inter-university collaboration through ICT tools become more widespread. And the study ab abroad and student exchange programs through overseas travel will decrease in relative terms. Uh, those um, possible changes include a mixture of complementary and also contradictory because it's quite difficult to predict in the future at the moment. So uh, also concerns and challenges of the future. International education via ICT are regarded mainly as an emergency response to the culture, current crisis or as an alternative to international learning through physical mobility. International edu educators express concern that online international learning methods are likely to fade away after physical student mobility resume on a large scale. However, it's crucial for university to leverage newly developed online learning tools even after the pandemic in order to offer inclusive international education, which reaches a large student pool who are unable to study abroad. Instead of progressing toward the new normal, some university, that's my concern, want to turn back the old normal. It will be important to position ICT-based education educational practice as an opportunity to create a new value and the meaning for international education and environmentally friendly and low cost manner in the new normal. So um, 
I see the last, this is the last slide. I see there is an increasing awareness. Uh, ICT based international education can effectively contribute to the expansion of international education at home. Moreover, today's st students are generation of digital native called Gen uh, Generation Z and have a high affinity with ICT based education. So, this situation could lead to the flatter relationship faculty and the student because students can be a teachers for senior academic staff. So um, efforts to develop quality online international education allow university to envision an effective and inclusive approach to international education. Again, as I said, in the post COVID-9 era, responding to the new normal situation requires a new modality of university internationalization. And it will have a significant impact on the reputation, attractiveness and attractiveness of higher education in the country as a whole. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I spent maybe too much time. No worries. Thank you very much, Professor Hiroshi Ota. I think there's a very good insight on planning and strategizing internationalization of the new era. It is important for us to be looking at the way forward and what you have actually shared with us has definitely been important, especially understanding student mobility and study abroad concept. Um, I would just like to ask the floor, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or you can even write the questions in the chat room. Now we've got about seven minutes for Q&A. Are there any questions from the floor? I welcome some of the questions. Quite well, a shy crowd this morning, but um, looking forward, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. But if you do not have a question, you mentioned, okay, there's a question from Lily Beth Galvez here. Um, on student mobility, how do you implement credit transfer in your university? Is there a form of a standard Japanese one or, you know, like ASEAN may be known for ACTS and all that? Yeah. Mm. Um, many universities, as you just mentioned, those credit transfer uh, scheme they're using, their system. But at the same time, institutional level, they have also created the transfer system kind of uniquely. For instance, okay, my university, we faced a program about uh, 10 years ago because all the days, a credit transfer means you, you studied one subject, one course at the university abroad. And then when you return home, if we have the same or similar kind of courses, then you can be transferred the credit, course A to course A dash at our home institution. But a student complained that, why do I have to take the courses it's, all, it's offered in my home institution? They want to have, they want to take the courses. They are not offered at the home institution. But the older days, we couldn't transfer those credits because we didn't have a, like a counterpart courses, equivalent courses. But now, is my university is changing. Yes, we first go to one-to-one -one credit transfer is the, the first way. But the, those, the second phase, if the courses, we don't have the similar one, we still recognize those credit as a kind of package. We have a kind of box study abroad credit. So some is typically Japanese uh, uh, law school students, law school students, undergraduate law school students, they go to America. America doesn't have a law school in undergraduate, they have a postgraduate level. So they are in trouble. They can't find those similar courses. They take many variety of like liberal art courses. They come back. We use the kind of box to recognize their study abroad uh, credit acquired at foreign institution. That's, we kind of use two ways. Hmm. There also is a limit, you know, the maximum of those credit transfer, but it's, we are kind of doing that way. Hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I have a question as well, uh, Pravota. How do you foresee, um, you know, capacity building training? I think that's very important. When everyone had to jump into the bandwagon and, and went online, um, do you agree it was easier for the students than the academics? What's your take on that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe you have heard is a problem is in Japan, not mm -hmm. only university companies, 
we are so called a uh, membership based employment means we hire kind of large number of the graduates or people um, on the job market once a year right so those people got trained and then transferred among uh, departments so basically we have a kind of where HR, human resource management, is a more kind of generalist basis. One time you are account, accounting section transferred to educational affairs section, and then another time is kind of transferred to those IT department. It doesn't work for me. It, that way it doesn't work. So we really need to change more kind of job-based employment. That we need a more expert. We need a more specialist in a certain field, especially international education and those IT, ICT. So we, I think we have to move on to the uh, new way of employment or recruitment. Plus, as you mentioned, we need more of those um, professional training programs. Probably these also can be delivered through ICT. Maybe a new kind of way is a micro-credential. And also, yes, um, those things. But at the, the moment, from my concern, even people who get the micro-credential, the study the things, this is the employer can buy this uh, credential or not. So it's, it's difficult to, to, to the things. We are in kind of stuck in the middle, in a shifting from obsolete system to kind of new system, or I would say more world standard. I think it requires the uh, incorporation of universities, students, academics. Uh, yes, that, that, that's yeah, definitely. To all the stakeholders need to understand the whole mm. ecosystem mm. where we need one another and thus yes. we need to be able to apply the knowledge with one another. In, in fact, in, in Japan, even my school's small institution and in awake of the COVID-19 crisis, we really work together through mm. ICT. We don't have to physically, we, we couldn't see physically each other. Exactly. But we have a YCT is also networking. We shared experience. We share the skills and the knowledge. That's helped a lot. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pravota. Um, we're down to our last minute already. And we would just like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. It was very, very useful for us to understand, to learn from your experience as well. We appreciate your coming into this session. And after this, will be another three presenters also sharing with regards to internationalization. I'm going to take a bit of an unconventional approach since we have three of our speakers here at the moment. If we would like for all the participants to switch on the camera, if we could have a group photo with everyone. And after that, we'll also incorporate Prof. Uh, uh, Nomura's picture in with everyone here as well, since we've got all of this. Yeah. All right. Can we request for everyone to please... Um, switch on their cameras. It's a great opportunity to have um, a picture with um, you know, our great scholars, experts in internationalization. It's okay to those who um, are unable to open, that would be okay. Can we get um, Azlin or Habib to please take the picture if possible? To those who can switch on the camera, if it's We've got over 86 participants at the moment, and we value each and every one of you for attending today's session. We've got three more speakers to continue on from here. Okay, all cameras allowed. Okay, Lynn. Azlin, okay. Now, one, two, three. Next page, right? One, two, three. I think everyone can switch on their camera already by now. So, all right. A third page, one, two, three. How many pages are there? Do we have one more? Yep. And one final one for the road. <laughs> one, two, three. 
Thank you, Lynn, for taking over, taking the pictures. Thank you very much, Professor Hiroshi Ota, for um, such a um, you know uh, such a thoughtful sharing and great insights on your part with um, the experience of um, Hito Tsubashi University of Japan as well. We look forward to working with you in the future as well, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very me. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right, now we've gone to our next session already. It's already 9.31. And with us today, we have Professor Dr. Keiko Ikeda from Kansai University of Japan. And her presentation will be on virtual exchange and the global classroom. With here, I would share her bio data for you all to read. And also there'll be a link in our website she is um, a very experienced um, scholar in the field of virtual exchange and also collaborative online international learning. And I've had the opportunity to learn a lot from her sharing and insight. So, Professor Dr. Keiko Ikeda, the virtual floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. And then, hi, uh, Rosetta, for sitting in the chat there. It's nice to see you too. Actually, I would have liked the video on. And I would have been able to talk to actual human faces. But in fact, if you don't want to do it, that's okay. But um, So let me share my slide here. And I hope you can hear my um, voice okay and see the slide now. Yes, I hope it's working. It's not nothing interrupting. And let me start. All right. Well, once again, I'm Keiko Ikeda. Thank you very much and uh, kindly um, being introduced to this uh, wonderful event today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lati, for, for doing that for, for me. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit in the introduction about the COVID and then how the impact was. And then moving on to a um, digitally accelerated higher educational level of um, education, teaching, and learning. And that includes the virtual exchange in a global classroom that I want to introduce today. Okay, so um, going back to the introduction background now, so education of more than 200 million tertiary students was suddenly disrupted. You probably heard that this summer as well. This was in 2020 due to the uh, university closures, as you know. And after a couple of years of the COVID phase that we've been going through, the most university around the world are preparing for a safe and effective learning environment by adapting a digitally uh, enhanced pedagogies. In the high income countries, uh, many had managed to switch online classes after only a few days of preparation. So United States could be a, one of the examples. So CEO of edX, for example, has described it once the world went from one to 3% of learning online to 100% of learning online. So that what is the change there. And as of 2022, uh, we see many parts of the world have opened their educational institutions fully and the many have gone back to in-person in teaching and learning modes as well. And UNESCO reported that the distance or hybrid learning was the major trend during the pandemic. And the many countries are using hybrid mode of teaching and learning now, applying both online and on-site modes of continued educational research activities. IAU Global Survey um, has now a two survey reports published, and then another one is upcoming very soon. In the first survey 2020, in the COVID time, it indicated that before the pandemic, the teachers with the online distance teaching and learning experience were in the minority. So showing that the less than 25% of uh, they had experience with the online teaching and learning. In the second uh, global survey report in 2021, we see a great increase in experience. Use of online learning is almost 100% or 90% or even more higher. And even that with the use of digital communication tools to communicate with students, virtual exchanges, collaborative online learning show a very high level of application globally. With approximately 500 respondents from 112 uh, 12 countries and territories for the 2021 report, it was reported that during the pandemic or with the pandemic impact, academic partnership for international collaborative learning, including COIL, has shown the most growth in Africa and Americas. The importance of international online collaborative learning is increasing, definitely, and then Kansai University too, we're pushing for international collaboration. The pandemic has clearly stimulated an increase in importance of the virtual exchange and collaborative online learning and the internationalization of the curriculum at home. As could have been expected uh, in, in that this increase, but for mobility itself, the effect is more mixed. And in order to enable virtual exchange in COIL and sorts, edutech plays a very key role. 
the great majority of higher education institutions have private sector partnerships for both education technology and beyond. And you see in the slide, Africa and Asian Pacific seems to show a great stretch here. And the Kansai University's trend may fit well into this trend as well. We have launched the Kansai University Digital uh, Transformation uh, of Education in 2021. This is a new initiative for us uh, with the three pillar concepts. So with technology, we're bringing out one inclusive, two borderless, and three interactive teaching and learning opportunities and equality for our campuses. What you see in the slide is a case at my university, Kansai University in Osaka, Japan, with the Educational Digital Transformation Initiative. It has built what we call global smart classroom infrastructure. In order to strengthen student experience in the high flex mode of a classroom, connecting both those online and internationally participating students, as well as those who are on campus. So application access to our global smart classroom system is in fact shared with our international partners with no cost. We have adopted the Zoom enhanced application software called Class. Uh, this is a, in addition to the hardware, the room itself, and which allows a wide variety of interactive engagement of participant monitoring by the instructor during the class session. We see a little clip here right in the slide. Um, we have been doing this many international clubs of learning until now without the GSC, but with the GSC, the, the engagement will be much easier and also much more available. Global classroom is a great way to enhance international education and education and higher educational level in general. Yet I believe it is important that we spend a bit of time talking about the risks and opportunities in a digitally accelerated higher education. So I'd like to focus on that a little bit today. One thing to note here before talking about the risks and opportunities, risk is opportunity. Whether analyzing risks or measuring the risk, considering the optimal way to mitigate a risk, there seems to be an endless potential to excel in the field. So risks and opportunities with respect to intensified digitally enhanced pedagogy are certain, certainly this case. So risks is opportunity. Now, having said that, I'd like to make a few remarks from here. Point on. First dimension of the matter I'd like to point out refers to the actual teaching skill set. So scaling up in digital skills and learning holes, a potential to increase the reach and the relevance of educational systems and improve job prospects for the youth in our fast changing and digitalized economies. This is beneficial to all countries, both high income countries to low income countries. But the risk, now are we really ready for that? Going into the third year of a pandemic, many of us educators have recognition that teaching online does not simply mean recording a traditional course lecture and posting it to the web and using a video conference platform like Zoom to deliver the same lecture online as the instructor would have given that, given that on campus face to face. So effective online education requires teaching and learning methods that engage students dynamically in an enjoyable and stimulating educational experience. And it seems that regardless of income level of countries that you see in the slide here, readiness to jump onto that next normal phase of this digital the enhanced the teaching and learning may not so well be ready yet. Also, we need to be more alert and aware of how to adapt the online modes of pedagogy by paying closer more attention to which subject are we talking about. So this slide is also an interesting one that coming from the IAU report that reflect the teacher's viewpoints on which disciplines seem more suitable for distance learning and who have, which has partially suitable and not suitable at all. If the subject is well suited, then we can say that adapting distance learning online modality should be more taken advantage of and we can continue having those online. And if they are partially suited then we will need to think about blending pedagogy to make it more appropriate. And if not suited at all, then we may need to keep thinking about maybe keeping those subjects to face-to-face -face in teaching, unless one comes up with the innovative technology to overcome those challenges. And like I was saying, risk is also an opportunity. So let me talk about how that um, this risk can be turned into opportunity. So to construct 
a well-designed online learning experience, universities should develop digital learning methodologies and provide digital learning context, tools, and support systems. When this is done well, globally assured quality of education can be made available to wider audience. As in this slide, this is from UNESCO, if we attempt to show the quality of digitally enhanced teaching and learning such as setting the clear goals and specific learning outcomes, generating transparency in the validation of courses, uh, designing suitable assessment methodologies, building assurance in the quali qualification standards, then education at higher educational institution overall, not just the international education, but just the overall, will be inspired and become globally assured in equality. To take an assessment, as an example here, there's a need to fully uh, align learning assessment procedures and criteria with online curricula and the pedagogical practices. Higher education institutions all over the world have explored various forms of alternative assessments during the pandemic, uh, passing fair approach, uh, open internet, open book exams, collaborative forms, portfolios, etc. You probably have tried it to yourself. And these are seen more suitable for authentic learner-centered assessment methods. And then adapting approaches like these were more made available because we had the shift online teaching by, by the pandemic. So we know how to do that and we know how, how they work. Do we want to go back to the end of the semester exam only approach for evaluation, which we have been doing before COVID as a majority purpose for evaluation and assessment when the pandemic's even no longer a problem? In my personal view, that would be a sort of regression or a reverse in the education quality. Another dimension I'd like to mention today, along with the ring of my topic here, is technology itself. So advancement of edge tech and then how they can assist us to project a more inclusive access to higher education is something I'd like to give a bit of time to think together. I'll start with talking about opportunities first for this one. So advanced technology definitely has a potential to enable wider population to be learners and also become teachers. I'm showing some of the actual cases here in the slide. The technology is now being increasingly used as assistive equi equipment for students with the special needs. Um, and then by the special needs, I mean in the very broad meaning here. On the right hand side, what you see is our global smart classroom application class. We use a particular function so that the sign language with or visual assistance can be easily made available in our day-to-day -day teaching and learning. So make it more inclusive. So we can also combine a class app with another useful app, as you see inside here. It's an AI automated avatar-based sign language translation app. So it can allow people to see the sign language in 360 degrees, which is pretty cool, so that the signs are readily understood. On the left-hand side, the you see is a telepresence robot. This is now becoming more widely used in conferences and classrooms nowadays. Those who are not in the physical present can now participate in the social activities through the robot. And one of the ways that to make the use of the GSC and the advanced technologies, as I had been mentioning, is um, for just to take an example from Kansai University, is a new program that we started called JMCP, Japan Multilateral Query Project. So this invites our global partner universities to identify, uh, identify instructor, to collaboratively teach with us, and the students in the network can freely participate and take the offered online virtual exchange modules. They receive the digital badge by participating in it as well. This was an outcome from the student diversity. Sorry about this. Um, let me turn that off. Um, it's a multilateral uh, multi query program just that we had in uh, last March. That was a five weeks and topic was 21st century skills. And uh, it's a quite diverse students that are joining in, as you can see in the slide. Uh, those who may not be able to come to Japan to study even join in. And the Kansai University Digital Transformation Initiative also using uh, this, they're using the Metabus. This is an entrepreneurship camp program using a Berbella application. In addition to this uh, digital transformation initiative, participants from overseas universities, such as a University of Colorado or Bridgewater State University joined in and, the, and they made international teams together to, to generate a business plan. 
And Avatar worked in the virtual offices, conference rooms, etc., in a virtual space with the three-dimensional realism. It was kind of fun. And then finally, as part of a, um, our international education practice, we're working with the Study Abroad Association to utilize VR materials in the maintaining and developing interest in outside world more than ever. And even when it's no longer possible to easily travel around uh, because of pandemics and other purpose, other reasons, they can still have a, a taste of a uh, taste of a uh, virtual world. We also worked with the, the same company, SAA to develop a virtual campus tour program for our, camp, our purpose. The virtual uh, campus tour can be experienced on the browser, uh, even if you don't have a VR, or you can just use this one of those simple box VR as well. So 300 degree camera video, YouTube, and more than available. Uh, so this is on the tour. So we enabled this to the students who weren't able to come into the campus yet, but they were uh, actually studying with us. Uh, during the uh, pandemic time and also the ones that were still behind the, um, at the home country. All right, so with the, all these opportunities and um, uh, coming from the advanced educational technology and now coming to the risks, so let me now discuss the risk at this point for advanced use of edutech. And that is coming from the point of view of inclusive access. It's a digital divide issue. So Van Dyke 2002 has identified the layers of digital device. Some of you may know the literature. With the pandemic impact, a second level digital divide, with implied, uh, which implies how students and teachers choose to use digital technology will divide those who embrace the merits and those who don't. And this has exacerbated a gap between the two devices even bigger. In the third level of digital divide, according to Van Dyke, which follows the second level, the students' performance and educational engagement will result in a, uh, dividing those who acquire global employability and who do, who, who not, who, those who do not. Young people are often assumed to be a digital natives and to have digital skills. Yet, um, it's been said, it has been pointed out that this is not necessarily the case all the time. To take an example from Japan, current Japanese youth are constantly connected to the internet and using digital devices on their phone, but predominantly only for social media and entertainment. So how can this risk be remedied? First and foremost, the digital access should be now understood from a multilateral viewpoint. For one, the concept was promoted by an alliance for affordance internet as meaningful connectivity may be a good start. Meaningful connectivity is a foundation for digitally enhanced education beyond the pandemic, and they argue that it is now a basic right. So meaningful connectivity, like 4G and devices and unlimited broadband connection and homework and place of study, and they should be available for daily use. In the real world, however, this meaningful connectivity is not available. It's only for one in 10 people in the countries. So meaningful connectivity offers enormous benefits for those who have it. Digitally teaching and learning, like the advanced educational tools I mentioned, those require this meaningful connectivity. So even for COIL virtual exchange practices, this is definitely the basics, and then we need to actually give a thought about that. So holistic approach to this digital device is very important, and let alone the adaptation of digitally enhanced education is absolutely the key. An action might be, must have taken place by multi-dimensional stakeholders. As an individual uh, instructor with uh, an unlimited connectivity, you might think of how to get around it. But however, while working at the creative way of getting around it, at the same time, we need to actually activate private, public, and educational sectors. And they need to collaborate to bring this, the enable this, base, uh, re promoting basic to a more meaningful connectivity level. And this has, this has been pointed out. In the UN General Assembly, President once mentioned as well, no one should be left behind and no one should be left offline. And this was, to, he was talking about the basic internet connectivity, but in addition to that, I would add to this, that no one should be compromised with the basic internet connectivity, but to build a scheme so that they have access to meaningful connectivity as well. So again, multi-stakeholder approach is strongly called for. And then let me conclude by talking about where we are going with this digitally enhanced teaching, um, teaching like the virtual exchange. 
Um, successful digitalization process may depend on identifying the program types and the components of the program that are most suitable for digitalization. So uh, taking into account the subject or the target subject uh, student audience and type of activities, all those things. And we must give attention to the student expectations and needs, consider employment expectation and needs, ensure the staff have the skills and support to deliver quality digital learning opportunities and having regulatory and equality frameworks that permit flexibility to innovate is going to be very, very important. So for my talk today, I did mention that um, on the virtual exchange as a part of a whole trend of emerging digitally enhanced teaching and learning. Now the virtual exchange and Acquire being widely accepted, it seems, and then it was adopted in a wild well, then we ought to raise up a scope of discussion now to more comprehensively understand online modality in education, internet and in international education, and propose a realistic yet forward-looking proposals. And that concludes my portion of the talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Keiko. There's a lot of insights uh, received uh, from you. Always enriching to be listening to your sessions. Uh, we have three questions here already. And the first question comes from um, Grace Makaltos. And her question is, may I know your process for internationalization of curriculum? Maybe quite a long process. If you could sum it up in two minutes, Keiko. <laughs> um, well, that's a whole story by itself. Yeah. But um, adapting a blended methodology was the, the first step. And that's one of the reasons why we started uh, adapting virtual exchange in Koyo since 2014. Um, so it's to internationalize uh, a more domestic curriculum and in, in having a, a bit of a part of it as, you know, doing a, a choir practice of projection. So that's the first step. And then becoming, you know, globally more uh, aware about how partnership and collaboration, collaborative learning with the overseas is, is important. That became sort of a trigger for some students to actually go on to mobility. And then, then some researchers actually collaborate, you know, uh, uh, collaborate in the research internationally. So that's the start and then all the steps that all the way that happens after. I hope that sums up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right, we've got another question by Andy Mashita Irwan. And the question, uh, he said, thank you for your presentation. Uh, may you share what to do to prevent screen fatigue from a long virtual classroom session? And how do you encourage active participation among participants? Yeah. Right, so um, do not assume that they are only learning when they're online, when you're actually inter 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 integrating an online learning, teaching and learning. You give them a prompt and then they stay, have them for say, one hour, for example you could actually do a sort of a virtual flipped classroom. So send them off to offline mode and have them actually work on their own processing it and then work on it. And so giving them a rest from the screen and then come back again. So having more frequent meetup, but having an interval between the two. So consider the whole curriculum as on online mode and offline mode all together. This is the way that you should be designing a digitally, digitally enhanced learning and teaching. Okay. I think many of us, when we say it's online learning, so it's no longer replicating a three-hour lecture, physical Correct. lecture, a three-hour virtual online lecture. So we've got to be Correct. a bit creative, coming up with maybe more program, uh, pro, um, problem-based learning or something where they need to discuss or find other aspect of actually doing studying as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Okay, we've got a question from Dr. Ahmad Taufik Hidayah Abdullah. Um, could you share some challenges, if any, in conducting global classrooms mm -hmm. and how do you overcome them? Many challenges. I mean, I gave you the, the peachy picture today, but there's a lot yeah. lots of challenges, of course. One of the challenges is more of a mindset uh, transformation, I would say. It's not the technology. Technology will find a resolution at some point and we have experts in somewhere, right? But for mindset change, that what that that doing it online or connecting with in a digitally enhanced method is going to be actually a quality quali qualified qualitative very high quality teaching and then learning that mode of acceptance is, is a, basically a challenge and the students might be a faster pick up and then the ones that who are teaching end of it and if it's senior them the furthermore the ones that who've been doing the traditional way for a longer time may actually have resistance against it so that would be my challenge. Okay. Um, one question, 
Um, this, when, when we went into virtual, when you explained about collaborative online international learning, virtual exchange, there's some confusion to some people in terms of conceptualizing or understanding the definition, especially with virtual mobility and MOOC mm. and online distance learning. Can you just share maybe some introductory, because some of our, um, our participants here are also beginners, to give, um, you know, to distinguish between the different, um, you know, okay. programs. Yeah. Okay, virtual mobility, you can think of it as just you're going to take an online course in somewhere else, an overseas institution. You might actually join into their LMS or e-learning programs that they offer, and you're joining as one of the participants to actually register and take it. There may be no uh, interactive sessions. There may be actually be only uh, on-demand video lectures that might be provided and you submit the task and then you finish your course. So there may not be opportunity to encourage other classmates. There might be some, might be, you know, some of them might try to actually integrate that too, but typically that's the case. And um, for virtual exchange in, a, in collaborative online international learning, there's a similarity there. The virtual exchange has more of a wider understanding, a definition of have multiple institutions join in, students coming from a different institutions and are going through one curriculum. That curriculum can be created among the institutions that they join, or it could be one institution for providing the curriculum to all, all students. COIL was a, a more specified uh, method among the virtual exchange. COIL, that you need to have a package, one package to one package. So instructor and students and another instructor overseas and the students of his or hers, they have to meet up and then they have to think about the collaborative learning project together and then going through that task together. So it has more, of a, a more designing in terms of a curriculum and um, you need to have more coordination. So that would be the COIL. Okay. All right. Um, hope you are able to clarify that to some of the uh, participants who have asked me that. Um, do you encourage multidisciplinary field of study for COIL? Yeah. Um, yeah. Different field or different disciplines working together for a call. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's very suited for interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary um, kind of a, a learning as well. In fact, it, I think it's encouraged, encouraged to have that a different discipline subjects, students actually get together to do that uh, collaboration. Um, but you do actually have to orient it that so that, that this is the purpose why they are coming, you know, going beyond their comfort zone in order to actually learn something new. You need to orient them well in order to actually have that core experience to be fruitful and then um, giving them a something to grow from. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Keiko. I think You've, you've shared with us a lot of new insights, new thoughts, and we, we, we have learned so much over this half an hour session. As usual, half an hour is never enough. <laughs> and we look forward to have more discussions with you in the future as well. Thank you very much Thank to you. Professor Dr. Keiko Ikeda from Kansai University for sharing her insights on virtual exchange in the global classroom. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we're moving, we're exactly on time now, um, and we're moving to our next session, and we are honored to have Professor Akiyoshi Yonizawa from Tohoku University of Japan, and his sharing today will be on internationalization of Japanese universities moving forward. Um, and here is the bio data of Professor Akiyoshi Yonizawa. We have also shared the information um, in the link of the chat room, and he's been actively uh, being a key participant for Japan Association for Higher Education Research, Japan Comparative Education Society, and Japan Society for Educational Sociology. And with his role as the Vice Director of International Strategy Office, we look forward to hear the future development of Tokyo University and other Japanese universities as well. So the floor is yours. Professor Akiyoshi Yonizawa. Okay, uh, terima kasih, uh, the, the professor Abdul uh, Latif Ahmad, and uh, uh, the salam alaikum uh, for everybody. And uh, thank you very much for uh, the inviting me uh, to such a wonderful part uh, the event. And uh, it's really my honor that uh, I revisit the virtually uh, to uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and uh, actually, the, I uh, when I uh, visited uh, the Kuala Lumpur uh, in, for the first time in 1997, uh, just before the so-called Asian crisis. So at that time, the, everything was really kind of economically booming, but the, the sky train was not there, so the, uh, the traffic jam was really, really heavy. 
But uh, it's a really, really exciting uh, opportunity for knowing the kind of uh, the energetic and the changing uh, the society. And uh, that kind of uh, international experience is really, really important for everybody, especially for the students. So that is my uh, the idea. And also, the, uh, of course, that the, within the uh, more than 20 years that uh, the old society has really, really changed. So the, uh, this is also true that the Japan is also uh, try, trying to change. So that maybe we can say, uh, I can say something about the kind of future perspective we are now facing and the challenges and also the kind of uh, the vision. And uh, the, let me introduce the, the new book we launched. And uh, actually, the, this is in Japanese. So the, it must be very, very hard for you, most of you, to uh, read. But uh, let me just uh, introduce it because that uh, the Professor Ota and the Professor Keda is a very active contributor of this chapter. And also the, uh, in this uh, the book on the global studies of the uh, undergraduate education uh, in Japanese, uh, we included uh, the case study of the UKM uh, as a very, very interesting case that uh, the, the, of course, the you are quite international university, but at the same time put more importance on uh, the national uh, identity or the national language and culture. Okay, so, and the, the, my talk is uh, basically uh, the kind of the much more conceptual rather than the pra uh, practical. So the, the, I'm, not, uh, I'm a practitioner, but uh, 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 much more uh, as a kind of a, the making, supporting the uh, university president and the government to make a vision of the higher education. So the, my work, uh, my talk will be much uh, relatively kind of a, uh, the, the, not that so practical, but the, maybe I hope that the, still uh, you enjoy the, my talk. Okay, so the, the, the first, uh, many, or uh, many of you may know that uh, the common definition we have uh, of the internationalization of higher education. And uh, some of you know that uh, the first definition developed by the, the Professor Jen Knight of the University of Toronto uh, in around the 2004 was the integration of the international, intercultural, or the global dimension in the purpose, functions, and the delivery of the post secondary education. So that was a kind of a uh, the definition that was developed uh, under the uh, very accumulation of the dialogue among the uh, at least a limited number of the countries, including Japan, that what is the internationalization of higher education as a phenomena, and then that they leads to this kind of a, the process oriented uh, the definition. And after that, the 1915, uh, sorry, the 2015, uh, the, 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 there was a kind of global uh, consensus again to update this definition. And then the, the red, uh, color, uh, red part was uh, added that uh, this means that the international process of, uh, intentional process of the internationalization and also the internationalization whole part, uh, this is uh, for the enhancement of the quality of education research to all students and uh, staff and to make a meaningful and contribution to the society. So this means that, uh, that we identify the stakeholders and the why we need to internationalize our university system on the internet university education. And uh, the, 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 I, in this slide, I set the title of the Japan and internationalization of higher education. So the, the, how the Japan is society or the Japanese universities perceive the meaning of the internationalization of higher education. And uh, maybe uh, uh, I should clarify that the Japan is, uh, or the Japan higher education achieved its international presence, mainly through the national integration, not through the internationalization. So the, actually the, the, the Japan uh, became uh, relatively uh, good status in economy and also the uh, culture and technology. Uh, uh, before uh, we started to internationalize. So what to the, 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 just like the, uh, the Malaysia uh, tried to uh, develop the national integration in the 1980s, we also tried to do that. And we are, uh, from that point of view, much more uh, successful in the national integration. Uh, so then the, uh, the, that was the kind of power uh, we got uh, to be, uh, improve our international presence. And the, uh, also, uh, it is also true that by utilizing this kind of uh, the, the achievement, we started uh, 
to act uh, the active commitment to the internationalization of higher education movement relatively early. So the, the I uh, started from the definition of the international higher education. Japan was one of the active member uh, to uh, the the uh, engaged in such a kind of a, the first first uh, discussion of the internationalization. And it is also true that Malaysia is also the very very important case, and also the. Uh, your colleagues are also participating in this project. Uh, the, the, as everybody knows that the private higher education in 1990s was uh, in Malaysia was really, really interesting case for us. And then the, the May, Japan made clear policy link uh, between the internationalization of higher education and the nation building under the global knowledge economy. And uh, that uh, tendency was, uh, was there uh, in the last 20 years. And then the now Japan is facing challenge to redesign the, its direction of higher education and the, and the internationalization of higher education in this last uh, two or three years. And especially after the corona uh, pandemic that uh, the, so the, we are still during corona pandemic, that we uh, have a, a new ten, uh, prime minister, uh, Prophet, uh, prime minister Kichida. And the, the gradually the policy is changing, but uh, still not very really visible at this moment. And the, the, uh, when we think about the kind of national or the internationalization of higher education, I know that uh, the most of you in this uh, uh, the, uh, the event uh, are more interested in the or more committed to the international education. But uh, it is also true that the research is also the very, very important function of the university, right? And uh, the, especially that uh, in my understanding that uh, many leading universities like QAM, uh, UK, UKM are trying to uh, improve the research performance. And uh, this is highly linked with the, especially for the academics and the, the, your graduate student to uh, be internationalized. So that is uh, one of the, the, uh, the uh, aspect that we need to think about uh, what is the meaning of the internationalization of higher education. And uh, also the social engagement is also very, very important. And uh, the, for example, the, the Tohoku University, my university is uh, trying to be a kind of the, the socially engaged university. But uh, we are also trying to be globally engaged university or the regional engaged university. So by doing so that we also uh, see another aspect of the internationalization. The, the, uh, if we summarize the, the basic attitude of the Japanese society and Japanese university, maybe we can say that uh, we try to pursue the academic excellence. And that this is a really uh, kind of visible part of the, our internationalization. And also the, the human resource development uh, is becoming, uh, again, very important these days. The inbound mobility so that we uh, realized uh, 300,000 uh, the acceptance of the international student uh, uh, just before the, uh, the pandemic. But this is much more uh, focusing on a kind of a people uh, who get into the Japanese society or the make a linkage with the Japanese society uh, to uh, kind of the sustain our society uh, and uh, uh, with the partnership, but also the uh, facing with the decrease of the young population. And also the outbound mobility is becoming more important that, uh, that we also have to uh, the, uh, the train the, our uh, the home students to be internationally active. And, uh, and uh, not, not like Malaysia that we are still relatively by, far behind uh, on the assuring the real uh, global employability through our university education, but we are trying to do that. And then the, the global and the regional engagement is becoming a uh, very big uh, the, the challenge these days, uh, including sustainable development, uh, the environment change, uh, pandemic, of course. And then the, the idea behind is that, uh, of course, that you can see that the, the brain gain, the brain circulation, brain linkage, these are the kind of the concept we should discuss, we can understand uh, what is uh, the incentive of the internationalization in Japanese case and the other country like Malaysia. And then the, there is a tendency uh, of the mindset we have that the Japan has. And uh, uh, the one of the mindset we have for a long time is that Japan should catch up the advanced economy such as the United States or the United Kingdom. And then the, to lead the frontier of the global trends so that we for example, if we have uh, kind of the, the global trends of the, uh, the online education, the virtual uh, education exchange, then the, the, this, is a, this is a kind of the, uh, the, the very forefront, uh, most leading uh, the cases. So the, we need to go, we need to catch up with, or the, we need to go 
more than that. So that kind of a pressure is uh, always there in, in the, our mindset. And then the, maybe I think that the many countries uh, in ASEAN are also sharing such kind of a idea uh, to some degree. So that in this uh, aspect that, that the international higher education is a uh, uh, meaning that academic excellence in many cases. The under, under another mindset or another tendency is that Japan, uh, we tend to think about that Japan should take an important role in the global community for survival. So in order to be survival, that we need to have some kind of the, the uh, visible as a nation for the visible as a national education system or the visible as a leading university. So their international higher education is intentional process for the uh, making a uh, meaningful contribution to the society. So that actually the, the new definition is actually from the point of view that uh, is really uh, a kind of uh, very uh, following the, the, this uh, the new uh, definition actually before the definition so that we are really good uh, student for this. And uh, the, uh, since that the Professor Ota already uh, discussed about uh, the, the international uh, strategy, uh, mainly from the kind of a comprehensive uh, internationalization uh, of the education field. And also the Professor Ikeda uh, already uh, discussed a lot about uh, the new trends of the, the, the co-learning uh, through the online education. So the, the, so the, uh, the, uh, my role should be that uh, explain more about the, the research side. And uh, the reason why is that uh, the, the Malaysia is one of the most prominent and uh, rapidly changing uh, university system that we go into the research of the uh, especially top universities. And then the other, the, we have uh, other three types of uh, academic excellence initiatives, so-called. And uh, that started uh, uh, in a beautiful manner in the uh, 19, uh, uh, 2001, uh, uh, when we, our ministry, Minister of Education declared that uh, we need to have the top 30, around 30 in world-class universities. So there uh, we uh, funded uh, uh, for improving the research activities or the funding support, the internationalization of university and the concentration of public budgeting to the limited number of universities for requiring the transformation of the university of finance. The, that's other kind of things we are trying to do. And the, the, so the, my point is that the, the, the internationalization, uh, it is especially visible as a policy uh, from outside of Japan, is highly linked with the academic excellence uh, rather than the kind of the, 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 the classroom-based intercultural uh, activities. There is a very big gap between the, the, the policy level discussion and also the the, uh, the so-called uh, the daily uh, classroom activities such as the, the Professor Ikeda already uh, talked about. And uh, there is a supporting, uh, uh, the project first one is supporting top research centers, so much more kind of the graduate students, doctoral students, postdoc students, these are the things first. And then the, we have some research institute uh, in uh, around 10 or to 12, uh, that is really the kind of top level high research uh, institute inside the university. And uh, there, uh, English is a common language and uh, everybody uh, actually uh, work with that kind of whether Japanese or not. But uh, the, the, the other uh, more comprehensive is that we are trying to internationalize the top universities and uh, the now we have a top global university project scheme that uh, we have 34 uh, the university, including the, the kind of the really top uh, 13, uh, the world-class universities. And there are uh, the, we uh, make a kind of comprehensive changing uh, of the uh, university schemes, such as the kind of including the diversity inclusion, also the, 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 uh, the, 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 the uh, improved the uh, language ability of the students, uh, exchange more so because the, these are very, very important for the ranking. Uh, so that was uh, uh, the very big uh, the challenge. And uh, the, we had a plan to make the around 10 universities top 100 in the world by next year uh, for 10 year project. And uh, it is quite unlikely to do that. But and now we have uh, the new project uh, to concentrate our research fund 
uh, to the limited number of the university. So that gradually we uh, identify the, the top university, including the Tohoku University and the Hitotsubashi University uh, to be invested. And now uh, our uh, government is now uh, just uh, passed uh, the new act to make a kind of the internationally uh, the strong uh, competitive uh, research university. And maybe we will uh, identify two, two, three, or four uh, universities uh, in Japan uh, to be invested. And uh, if everything goes well, uh, the the money with a kind of university fund, it's a kind of uh, the uh, the budget, uh, the borrowing the money from the up, uh, uh, and then the, we have uh, ten trillion uh, Japanese yen. This is really, really the big number. And then the, the, we do not use it uh, as a kind of the just expenditure, but the, uh, use it for the yielding the, the interest. And then the, based on the interest, uh, the, they will support the, the, the top university. And, uh, and by doing so, maybe if everything goes well, that uh, the Tokyo University or some top university will increase the, the income about 20% more. And that is a really big, and uh, it is more, much more bigger than the, the historical one. And then the other, uh, the, here we are uh, going back to the kind of conceptual discussion that the, the uh, when we think about the internationalization, uh, we always have to think about the, how the academics or the university teachers or the students, uh, but the much more like the university teachers uh, are thinking about what is the meaning of internationalization. Uh, for the education purpose or the academic purpose. And then the state, uh, the government also has their own idea. And the market, uh, especially the industry, has a uh, own market uh, the idea uh, to, uh, uh, most of the industry are trying to be global. And then they need a globally competitive employee. And uh, there, uh, when we analyze the, the, the kind of direction for the future or the direction of the current uh, internationalization education, especially focusing on undergrad education. And maybe uh, I, we set up a kind of this kind of diagram so that some uh, system going to the much more uh, directed the global common goals. So the, 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 the globalization means that the kind of uh, the integration to the one type of the uh, culture or the system. The other idea is that national local context is still very, very important. And the other uh, idea is that the, the, the education purpose oriented uh, discussion or the academic purpose oriented discussion uh, make a reform of internationalization. Or that the, we can also uh, get the lots of uh, requirement from the government and the employees. And the, this is a kind of a, the, the very uh, the Japanese perspective, uh, how we perceive the other country. And the, I, I said that the, the Japan is facing with the, uh, the decrease of the population. And our population currently is uh, 126 million people. And this is about, about four times of the Malaysia. But uh, the, uh, the, the, I'm sure that the, these countries are such as Malaysia, Australia, Netherlands, the South Korea is much smarter and uh, vivid for the internationalization, partly because of the population size is relatively small. And also that this is kind of survival strategy or the very must to change out uh, so that we are actually following the uh, these kind of uh, the, uh, the uh, fast one case. And it is also to that the very big countries such as the, the China is, they have a kind of a model, uh, the, the, they have a very strong uh, request from the government and uh, the employers, but also the trying to, uh, uh, the uh, protect and develop the, the Chinese way or the the, the national way. And the, the, the European country, especially the German, uh, traditional German uh, university system, also trying to be not really kind of very, very Anglo-Saxon. And then the, uh, also the, they took more importance on the university autonomy, right? And then the, if you compare with the UK and the US, uh, of course it is kind of just a matter of the balance, but the, the UK is uh, kind of quite radical uh, by uh, changing the higher education system uh, based on a, a requirement of the government and the employers, as you know, and the Australia uh, to some degree uh, following this relationship, uh, the, the direction. But uh, under the US, uh, that was a kind of global uh, common goals perspective, but uh, the more, uh, if you go uh, limited to the elite university, 
uh, they are much more autonomous and uh, they really, really put importance on the, what the university think about. And uh, th there is a kind of room to be autonomous in decision making. And what is going in Japan is that as follows. So the, the Japanese university academics, if you see the kind of ordinary uh, Japanese university academics, uh, we are uh, quite uh, kind of conservative from the point of view that uh, we are uh, based in a, our the, the academics within our national system uh, for a long time. And then the, also that we put important academic autonomy freedom, okay? But uh, the, the Japanese government and the Japanese industry is, uh, uh, Again, the relatively nationalistic, but uh, uh, the more uh, towards the global uh, influence, and then the uh, they are really, really now the getting pressure uh, to the making pressure to the university to change, and that is the, what we are thinking about. And uh, under this condition, the, the we are having the kind of a, uh, two different direction and we are still in a process to uh, compromise how to do that. But uh, the one uh, direction we are now having is that the more inclusive wide range of internationalization versus the future further pursuit of the academic excellence. That is a uh, kind of two direction is now spreading. And then the, the, in the background, maybe you can say that the neoliberal are uh, the knowledge and space based uh, visionary making and the global stakeholder engagement based visionary making. And uh, the, I think that the both are actually correct. And uh, the, under this uh, diagram that we are watching out and that we are trying to make uh, the future. The finally, I'd like to stress that uh, what I basically talk about the system things, right? Uh, the, and then the, the, I talk about much more work level and then the Professor Ota and Ukeda talk about the system level. But uh, it is really, really true that uh, the communities such as academic society, the social student learners, uh, actually, as a community, decide many things. And uh, maybe if you go to the see the kind of classroom of the Professor Ikeda, that is exactly uh, the, the what we can say. But uh, the the online education is really really interesting. The the, the I really, really uh, respect uh, the the initiative of the Professor Keiko Ikeda, and we are also trying to uh, uh, Tohoku University trying to be a leader of the international international collaborative learning. But uh, the the, as a kind of process that, that this is uh, tend to be more individual learning and uh, more fit to the individual learning because the pace of the, the learning can be changed more flexibly by making, uh, uh, including expanding the virtual uh, context of the virtual part of the, uh, the education. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, the, uh, I would like to have some kind of a mutual uh, the interactive discussion with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Pravaki. I think there's a lot of information here, especially learning about how Japan is moving forward, what Japan has experienced. I'm opening the floor to, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand, or if you have a question to ask, you can type it out in the chat room. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand, so also put it in the chat room. I've got a personal question that's been passed on to me. Um, how successful has the you know, global top university project been? for the institution. I mean, that's that's been quite a headliner for a lot of other universities, especially for us in the ASEAN region. How successful has it been? And what is the progress with the university so far? If you, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, I think that uh, if you see the outcome as a, by indicating the, our, uh, the, the trial to internationalize our university, uh, especially for a top global university project. I think, uh, I'm not sure that uh, we are completely successful, but uh, uh, we are to some degree successful. So the, the, if you go to the uh, top university uh, in Japan, uh, including Hitotsubashi University, uh, if you go to graduate school, uh, the 30% or the more uh, students are now international students. And it is quite common that any subject that uh, have uh, the program is somehow in English. And the, considering the, uh, the country that hasn't have any kind of colonial experience from the uh, English speaking country, this is a very big achievement. And then the, we also have a lot of connection that, that really happens. And the, 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 not only for the university, but the, the gradually the primary school and secondary education is also changing. 
So the, our language ability or the international connected is improved a lot. But uh, it is not really uh, uh, going to the, uh, the achievement of the research performance yet, or the not really. And uh, our ranking uh, status is in many cases the declining and our research performance record are declining. But uh, this is not because of the uh, internationalization is failure. And uh, my understanding is that, the, that this is much more like a social structure problem. So the first of all, that, uh, uh, there is a very small incentive still that uh, the top Japanese university students to be very, very global like uh, the Malaysian students. Uh, actually that uh, we have still a very good job inside Japan and uh, the membership uh, means that uh, the, the once you become a member of the Japanese company like uh, the, you know, whatever the Matsushita or the, or the Toyota, and then the, you will get some opportunity to be globalized. So that, that is a mechanism is still working and that, that is a very big uh, problem for us. And then the, the, the big problem is that the, the, the internationalization fund is very small con considering the research fund to improve the research ranking. So right. that's the reason why that we start a new funding project, and I hope it will work. And uh, but uh, there are lots of lots of uh, discussions still there that whether it will work because the the national funding is uh, actually given to the top university it means that the national government is uh, directly uh, the intervene the management system, and okay. this is quite uh, the. Uh, different or the, the contrast with the, the your uh, decision that uh, the Malaysian government has tried to give autonomy more to the top leading university in minors and grades that by corporatization. So that is a very, very the opposite side. So the, the still uh, we are discussing that how to assure the autonomy and uh, how to assure the effectiveness of the, the management and then the, how we can protect and develop the, the daily education life of the, the not only the university, but also the other universities in Japan. Understandable, a great insights there. Uh, Pravaki, we have a question, which is also in line with where you have stopped. And also when you showed the grid, you know, it really opened our eyes in terms of where each countries are, whether, you know, you're looking for full autonomy, global economy, or, you know, the, the assistance from the government and the requirements that you do with regards to the national context. There's a question for you from uh, Grace Bakaltos. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, Akiyoshi. The question is, how supportive is your government towards internationalization of higher education? Do you also do internationalization road mapping and how effective is this process? I think globally, different countries may have different approaches yeah, in, terms of, um, in terms of the ministry's backing or the government's backing towards that. And I'm sure Japan has its own story. You've also shared earlier on. Could you just enlighten us further with that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the Japanese way uh, compared with other country, it's maybe I can summarize as follows. So the, the, uh, some of you may know that the uh, familiar with the, the, our Japanese university collaboration in the field of engineering to the ASEAN University Network. It is called ASEAN SIDNET, AUN SIDNET. So the ASEAN University, uh, the top university, have uh, that kind of league. And then the, the, especially in the engineering field, uh, the Japan committed a lot uh, for more than 20 years to uh, develop the regional uh, engineering community and uh, the supporting the JICA fund and also the uh, operate the kind of the, this kind of international collaboration program uh, uh, even now. And the, the, uh, of course the money is the one of the very important uh, thing, but uh, at the same time, we introduced a very effective management system, I believe. And uh, I think the operation system of Japan is quite, quite uh, the, the, from the point of view, the very uh, rigid and the very systematic. And then the, we can do on time uh, everything. <clears throat> However, uh, the, that sometimes intervene a lot <laughs> about the, the autonomous way of the Japanese flexible manner of the Japanese universities. That is the uh, thing. So that the, we have a very detailed indicator uh, reporting to the government that uh, how many uh, students have what kind of a TOEFL score or whatever. 
And then the, we are quite obsessed to the kind of the achievement of this. And uh, maybe it is not only our sister society, but maybe the many of your academics will face with the kind of citation mindset, right? <laughs> right? So these are the kind of pressures uh, always there. And uh, the, the, we, what we are trying to do is that the, to make a J Japanese university by autonomous by multipolarizing our stakeholders. So that we identify more the, the indicators or the, the feedback to the student directly, or the industry, or the local community, international community, and the government. So government should be one of them. And then the, by doing so, uh, we can have much more integrated idea. And then the, we can have more autonomy. So that is uh, what we are trying to do. So by integrating the kind of uh, our good operation system and the, 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 uh, the more autonomous uh, system. So that just like uh, ASEAN are trying to develop the kind of a very good autonomy by with the good balanced collaboration with the, the surrounding kind of big country like the China or the India or the Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kiyoshi. I think we've learned so much here, you know, especially with regards to strategy and, you know, higher education policies and moving forward and the changes that we have to adapt with, uh, you know, what COVID has brought to us. And I think listening to the Jap Japanese university's experience and linking it to, for example, in my country where Malaysia is heading as well, is definitely a valuable, valuable experience for me to be witnessing this as well. Thank you very much, Professor Kiyoshi Yonizawa. Thank you, thank you very much for your commitment and your you know your support for being here sharing your insights just to let all of you know we've got participants from over 12 different countries um, you know from brunei from singapore from philippines uh, from japan malaysia and also as far as france and the us and india and vietnam to name a few i apologize if i've missed out some of the respondents thank you very much Prova Kiyoshi, and we hope to work further with you as well and to gain more insights from your experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move on to our final presenter for the day. And we have Professor Nakao Nokomura from Tsukuba University. Hello, Prof. Nakomura. How are you? Hi. Okay, fine. Thank you for having uh, coming here. And your topic in your presentation today is on online cultural exchange activities for promotion on student mobility with partner institution. I think towards this past two years, you, need, um, you discover you know, who are the partners that you can work with on a virtual front as the physical um, way didn't take place. I pass the floor to you for, another, for the next half an hour. Thank you very much, Prof. Nomura. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ratif, uh, and uh, for the opportunity to share my experience on the virtual cultural exchange activities. So let me uh, start sharing the screen. Okay, so the, I hope my screen is visible to you. Okay. Okay, the title of my uh, uh, talk is uh, Online Cultural Exchange Activity for Promotion of student mobility with partner institutions. And actually the, I'm working for the, a lot of activity for the student mobility exchange, but my original field is the life and environmental sciences and my specialty is biotechnology. But somehow I have some experience to work with the people outside Japan. So I be more involved in this kind of activity and serving as a like um, student exchange and the student support center as well as uh, I'm in charge for the Southeast Asia, including Malaysia. So the, um, first I'd like to share some the current situation related with the student exchange. Um, so the, um, the, as we know, I we, as we recognize that the stu study abroad, the student exchange mobility is sometimes difficult under this situation. And each university has to set a guideline for study abroad because many students are coming to university with the expectation to go for study abroad, but we cannot do as we did before. So the one of the important, um, let's say, parameter or the information from the government, which most of the Japanese university consider to decide their guideline for study abroad is uh, this one. So the, um, if you, your institutional university consider the mobility with the Japanese universities, uh, most Japanese universities consider this one. This is like a risk level overseas travel safety information by Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And they put the risk level 
in the two categories. One category is the infectious disease risk, another category is the general risk. And the, at this moment, many people pay attention to the gen, uh, infectious disease risk in the uh, purple or light purple color. So the, um, this um, is related with the infectious disease, including the COVID-19. And uh, uh, most of all of the country around the world is level two or level three. And, uh, uh, but we need to consider another category of the risk, it's a general risk. And uh, it's, you can see at the right side and level one to four. So the, um, this is not really related with the uh, infectious disease, but it's uh, like a general risk, like a terrorist or the, those uh, safety uh, level. Then the especially general risk, if the level is more than two, it means uh, orange or red color uh, or the light orange color, uh, most of the university decide not to send the student. Uh, some area in the ASEAN is also uh, has this color. So that means uh, the university in that area, um, university do not allow student to go study abroad. And the level one and level zero is okay. They think, um, we allow students to go. And uh, we have some other situation that um, uh, still I have to say that the border control and the Japanese government is a bit more strict than the other countries. So the, um, that, will, that is affecting the inbound of the international students coming to Japan. It's getting less stricter, but the, if we compare with other countries, uh, we still require some uh, uh, more documents or the, uh, like a diagnostic test before coming to Japan. And uh, this caused the um, non-balance or imbalance between the inbound and outbound due to the difference in the study abroad guideline. So the, um, uh, many students uh, who are thinking to, uh, to study in Japan has a bit more difficulty to come to Japan compared to the Japanese students go abroad. So the, um, that caused one uh, thing that the people who are studying Japanese or Japanese culture has um, a bit um, more, how to say that, lose their in intention or the uh, encouragement to study those things. Then they shift to other uh, culture or the language in Asia. In this moment, um, this is an emerging situation that, that we use, utilize this student exchange scheme to support for the student and the difficulty in the continuation of studies due to the international conflict. So the, um, I think many many universities start receiving the student under this kind of situation and offer the uh, opportunity for them to continue their study or research. And uh, so that um, I could uh, itemize some uh, transformation of the student exchange. Um, one is uh, a lot of universities start offering the co online courses using IT tools and uh, for the this is mainly for the graduate student, but the supervision for the thesis research study through online, also they think it's contented. And uh, short-term internship program are doing, being done online as well. And uh, one of the important functions of the university is uh, like a social and cultural exchange in the campus, but we cannot have it in the campus. So that we, many university uh, started this kind of social cultural exchange activities uh, as a virtual. Then one of the initiatives we started is like a um, casual uh, chat uh, space, virtual. Uh, we call this school chat and virtual cultural exchange activities. And uh, we have been doing this um, since 2020 spring semester from April. Uh, the one session is a one hour and uh, this are uh, like detail about this. And um, um, from here, I'd like to share some of the experience and uh, tips for this kind of virtual uh, chat event uh, from our experience. So the one first 10 to 15 minutes for plenary to share the information or those um, moderated by the student. And after that, we have free chatting. And the important thing is that we should not have it for long, so long, but we should have it in a regular basis. And the seven to eight se session per semester. And usually the first of all, first semester, we didn't have much participants, but we kept doing it and the participants kept increasing. Then the, and nowadays we have more than 100 participants every session and about, about um, 30 to 40 percent from our home university and the 50, around 40 to 50 percent are from Asia and 10 to 20 percent are from the other region. 
And uh, from school chat, uh, many students or many partner universities uh, came up with idea to have uh, some spin off event with uh, like online academic debates or Japanese culture class. And uh, I'd like to share some of the, um, how to say that, uh, good practice or the points that you, if you'd like to organize. First, then the, uh, we need to make it as simple as possible and easy as well. And for participation, but better to require the registration to track their uh, home university and their, their simple information. And uh, time for the one session will be one hour. If it's too long, I think we will not have much student. And we do it regularly. And evening time after class will be better for the student. And the clear and simple explanation for the purpose and the rules in every session. That this is uh, important also because uh, some area, some region, I think there's a bit strict on the like a publicity or those uh, copyrights issues. So that we need to explain the rules of this um, chat uh, every time. Then um, we usually employ our home student, a home university student as organizing staff. That this is a photo showing that a plenary session, the student introduced the culture or language. And um, um, we need to use a suitable online to accommodate the student um, because some students are accessing from the cell phone and some from the tablet or some from the PC. And we need to use the online tool to accommodate the student from all devices. Um, nowadays, we have a few um, very sophisticated IT tools to have more fun, but those sophisticated tools sometimes they don't accept the access from the cell phone or tablet. So we need to select the, the suitable online tools. And also internet connection or the data transfer speed and the uh, internet is different. Some students are having a very slow internet connection. That, that's another criteria to select the online tool. And before uh, chatting, uh, usually you should have a kind of interesting data or anecdote in the plenary session by the student. And also, although we set the topics or themes every time, but we need to have a flexibility uh, to have a student more fun. And also the, um, from our experience, there is the gaps in the affinity with the online activity in different regions. Uh, I could say that in students from Asia have more higher um, affinity with those online activity, but uh, uh, students from other regions, some regions are not really interested in this kind of activity. So then uh, if we'd like to have a um, diversity in terms of the region or countries, we should consider this kind of things. If we do not uh, consider this and disseminate the information to flyers to every region equally, uh, diversity will not be equal. Uh, then we have several uh, spin-off uh, cultural activities. One is a G-chat. Um, this one is uh, like an uh, online chat for improving the conversation skill in English or Japanese. Um, in Japan, the many students are uh, thinking about study abroad for improvement of the com communication skill in English. And, uh, but the Tsuku chat is for the cultural chat, not the spe specifically for the language study. But uh, we, we, that's why we prepare this uh, to, for the students who like to improve their communication skill in English or Japanese. So that we have a matching and we have uh, prepared a space for the students who like to study English or Japanese. Yeah. And the J chat is uh, like uh, something like a Tsuku chat, but they're all in Japanese. So the majority are from Japan, but the, some students from abroad, they like to join the something like Tsuku chat, but all in Japanese language. And the got chat is uh, this one to one, man to man chat for the language for specific um, language, like Spanish, French, Korean, Malay. Those, uh, those who would like to go study abroad in those countries, and we could make uh, kind of the uh, matching for the student from those countries to study their specific language. And we have another um, chat for the connection between the local community and the student. We call the City Chat Cafe. This online chat between the scuba student and the people from the local community. And the local community uh, is usually the uh, senior citizens or the people who are interested in the communication with the foreigners, especially with the 
uh, the family with the preschool kids, or those um, uh, people in the International Association of each cities of Scuba. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Back to you, Dr. Latif. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Nomura. It's always exciting. Uh, my students always share their experience being part of the Suku chat, and they've always um, you know, enjoyed themselves meeting friends from not only Japan, but from different parts of the world. And that sort of filled in the gap uh, that existed with what the pandemic provided us. And what was interesting was it also allowed those from lower socioeconomic status who were unable to afford to go out physically before, they had the opportunity to participate in Suku Chat and make new friends as well. So I will I always see them update updating and telling me about how their experience have been very, very positive. I have a question from Dr. Ahmad Taufik Hidayah Abdullah from Uniza. Uh, he says, Good morning, Prof. Namura. Could you give an example of a success story of an, an online cultural exchange program from a university in Japan with its partner overseas? What is the program like and how do students benefit from the program? Um, I think your Suku chat is a, is a big success story there, but uh, do join, uh, do share your thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah as in my title, um, that our purpose is not having a chat space. I think we, uh, one of the, our definite goal is to promote the study abroad. So that from Suku chat, uh, many students decided to study abroad. And also the many um, students start thinking about the, how to say, how much they need to get the international experience. And they take action to move it. And some decided to go to uh, study. But I think actually you can receive some student. Uh, they she's actually decided uh, through the communication with the student from Malaysia through Sukucha. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the good stories about from this one. Thank you, Prof. Namura. Prof. Namura, how do you, um, you know, how do you, ensure intercultural communication competency of the students. I mean, a lot of students, it will be their first time interacting with people of different culture. And online, you know, how, do, how does intercultural communication translate via the virtual realm? You know, it's quite challenging for that. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, what, are your, what are your experience in that? Yeah, that, I think that's a good question, but uh, um, we, we still uh, looking for uh, some good, uh, scale or measure the, how to measure their uh, competence uh, which they gain from the school chat. But uh, uh, so sometimes it's uh, difficult, but the, what we are trying to do is to, although we have a flexibility on the chat topic or teams, but usually we monitor the student chat space. I usually join and monitor the student and yeah. uh, how much they are concentrating on the uh, chat. I think um, if we do not have this kind of monitoring system, uh, I think chat is just a casual chat become. I think they, they don't get any competence. But uh, I think we actually we employ out of students uh, to have a moderator in each breakout room. All right, yeah. Thank you. I think Scuba has been quite in the forefront with uh, doing you know, cultural activities via the online front. Uh, I know the focus has always been on student mobility. Has there any uh, plans in your pipeline to consider, um, you know, um, representatives or our international relations officers to, to be, you know, having their own cultural activity session. Because I think throughout the pandemic, everyone went through a lot of challenges, a lot of experiences. Maybe that would be a good friend for them to sit and discuss as well. Yeah, actually, the, the Suku Chat is not limited only to the student and the, some of the <laughs> staff are joining. And uh, actually, we have a similar activity with the partner of other projects and uh, um, because if it's open to the students, staff, professors, some staff are really uh, reluctant to join. So we have a specific staff and staff uh, chat uh, with the partner in the campus in campus project. And uh, I think many staff are uh, enjoying those chat space with the partner universities. Thank you, Prof. Namura. We have a question from Supansa, part of AIMS. Yeah? I'd like to participate in Suku Chat uh, sometime too. You know, what kind of cultural topics are discussed in Suku Chat? I think it's quite extensive, Supansa, but let Prof. Nomura answer that, yeah. Yeah, I think this is from the Miss Pink from Riot. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah that we prepare several topics and the we, important thing is that we incorporate idea from the student and the uh, student staff from University of Tsukuba as well as uh, we get some 
um, how to say, the idea from the participants. And so far, we tried many kinds of topic. And if the participants has had some idea to uh, be focused on the Tsuku chat, we can propose that one. So that um, we don't limit to the student and the uh, partner universities. I think people from the right head also you can join. <laughs> I think you can join next time. Definitely, Ping. I think you can join. Definitely, they've been very active. Can we have any more questions? If if uh, uh, well, uh, Supansa, do they have anything on ghost stories? Uh, no more. Yes, we did. We did. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's about ghosts across cultures as well. So yeah, it's like right. exciting to, to learn from that. Uh, if we have any questions, if some of you are not typing it out in the chat room, you can also raise your hands. We've got a few minutes to go uh, with regards to question. Uh, I think Prof Nomura is excited to be sharing some of um, his experiences as well. How was uh, the experience getting participants? You know, were students, um, you know, raising their hands, wanting to participate, or what is it? Was did it involve a bit of persuasion, especially something new for them as well, right? Um, out of the normal element of things, yeah. Um, usually, we send this. Uh, you mean the how to join this uh, yeah, yeah. event? How to encourage students to participate? Uh, okay. Yeah, because some students might might feel a bit uh, reserved or, you know, uncertain about joining yeah. sort of activities, yeah. Um, I think that we have, we should have a breakout room uh, to have a, a chat with a small number of the students. If we keep the plenary only about more than 100 students, I think they hesitate to talk. So we keep the breakout session and uh, each breakout session, the maximum is about five to six. And uh, dissemination of the information, first we disseminate through the ILO in each universities. But I think nowadays, I think our friends to friends and SNS, we disseminate. So the um, many students and uh, uh, many university which has no academic element at Cuba. I think they uh, ask for the um, participation of the student and the, we, we start negotiation about this one. And the, some students are not from the partner universities, actually. All right. So it's very much open to all. And we encourage participants from all students as well. Um, okay, thank you. Are there any more questions from the floor? If there are no questions, thank you very much, Prof Nomura. Uh, but Prof Nomura, I may need to request you if you could just take a solo shot of yourself, a picture of yourself to be incorporated into the video as your session was a bit later uh, towards the day. If you could just look at the camera. Uh, if Azlin, if you could take a picture of Prof Nomura, that would be great. Okay, uh, one, two, three. Okay, thank you very much, Prof Nomura. We appreciate the insights and um, University of Kabangsaan Malaysia and Scuba has always been working extensively and we hope that um, we can continue on the relationship stronger as ever and we've been Throughout, we've been very active, even during the pandemic, even more. And, and I hope that this will, you know, strengthen the future as well. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, now, um, thank you very much to all our four speakers. We have now reached um, a session where we will be breaking everyone into three groups. Now, I would like to showcase what the group discussion will be all about. So if we could show the questions. <clears throat> The next session will be involving 35 minutes of group work discussion. And please, we do value your input. And we will be giving the link for the certification after the work group session has ended. Uh, for this part, what we want to do is that we'll be breaking you all into three groups. And three questions will be highlighted. And um, kindly, please, uh, to the secretariat, please share the screen for the three questions. And we would love to get your inputs and insights on this. So the three questions are, how ready is your university in dealing with this new age of internationalization? Second question, what are the challenges that you face in planning towards the support of internationalization at your university? And lastly, what are the support required by your university to promote internationalization during the endemic period and beyond? We will be breaking you up automatically through three different groups, and you will have 35 minutes to discuss. There will be three very established facilitators who are Dr. Fifi Hanista, who is the AIMS Executive Secretary. We have J. Aizat Hisham Ahmad, the Director of IMCC, International Mobility Collaboration Center from University Science Malaysia. 
Dr. Fifi is from University of Malaysia Sabah, and we have Dr. Tano Unja, who is the Deputy Director of the UKM Global in the National, National University of Malaysia, University of Kebangsaan Malaysia. They will be assisting you throughout. Your groups will consist of deans, deputy deans, intercultural, um, international relations officer, and also maybe some of the mobility students might be in the group as well. We look forward for the discussion. There'll be 35 minutes of discussion and followed by eight minutes presentation from each of the three groups. So I'll pass it over to the secretariat to be sending you off in your group discussion. And after that, please come back to the main room as we'll be sharing the insights from all the different groups. So, Chair Haikal, um, the floor is yours and the breakout room is being prepared right now. I would like to say thank you very much. Um, I would like to say thank you very much for, to the presenters today, to the speakers who have actually uh, you know, given, shared a lot of insights. Thank you very much, Professor Hiroshi Ota, Professor Keiko Ikeda, um, Professor Nakao Nomura, and also uh, Professor Aki for sharing their insights throughout the session. We truly appreciate it. Um, if now the breakout rooms are open and kindly attend to each of the breakout room sessions. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I think 35 minutes went just like that, wasn't it? Especially when people are discussing and, <clears throat> you know, we, we value this input. Uh, the results from your discussion will be incorporated into our final report as well, trying to understand what are the issues or problems um, faced by university and also what are their plans for the future. So to begin the session, now each group is given eight minutes uh, to speak, and we would like to nominate the facilitator. If we could have group one, um, Mr. Isaac. Oh, wow. So we are group one. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Professor Abdul Latif Ahmad. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting all of us to be part of this event. I think this is something really important, especially on the topic the future, what is going to happen. Now we are talking about transition of endemic and pandemic, as from pandemic to endemic, sorry. So what are the expectations? What are the things that we may need to face in the near and the far future? So I think um, my group has been um, really um, interestingly discussing, and we come from a diverse group of people, mainly from ASEAN. So we have gotten opinions from uh, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and many others. And um, I think we will actually be uh, looking at these questions very seriously for the internationalization of the future. And um, it's really an interesting topic. So I think like you said, uh, Prof, the time 35 minutes went through swiftly. Um, I just thought that suddenly I got the message that the group, the breakout room is going to be closed. All right, so uh, my name is Aizat. Uh, thank you so much. I will be presenting on what has been discussed and the output and outcome from the discussion. Okay, so the first question is, what are the challenges that you face in planning towards the future of internationalization at your university? Now, interestingly, uh, some of the points come from the Ministry of Higher Education themselves. So we do hope that this challenge, uh, which I'm sure is being faced by not only institutions of higher learning, but also the authorities such as the ministry and um, budget and funding is always the key thing that becomes a challenge for us when we want to make sure internationalization happens uh, within our institutions and beyond. So the funding and budget talks about facilities, the platforms, applications, even, for example, the Zoom platform needs subscription. So when we need subscription, we need some funds and budgeting. All right, that's one. Uh, the next challenge that was discussed among us in our group is the culture. This comes from our colleague in the Philippines, particularly. Uh, when we talk about culture, um, especially universities or institutions of higher learning that are very new in internationalization, for example. Now, when the pandemic hits, it becomes a bit more challenging to inculcate the culture of internationalization, to embrace the internationalization. And most of the time, um, the international centers are the expected department or unit or the stakeholder that is looking at internationalization, which is wrong um, in our opinion, because it should actually be 
the whole institution and beyond to work together closely for internationalization, not only one department or division that is focusing and everything is done to the specific office that handles. We are mainly, we as in the international centers, which mainly the participants of today's session is looking at this internationalization through its office as a secretary and facilitator. Everyone needs to come together. All right, uh, Mr. Rollins, we are not, Mr. Haika, we are not yet done with the first question. The slide is showing already the first, uh, okay. Okay, so the preparedness and adaptability to transform. This is another challenge that is related to the culture. So when people are mainly not having the culture of internationalization within the university, they are not prepared. So how do we want to address this challenge of preparedness and the adaptability uh, level of people when the pandemic happens particularly is also another challenge in terms of teaching and learning uh, to be innovative and creative um, in order to be prepared for the future is a challenge all right so that's addressing the first question the next question how ready is your university okay uh, when we talk about internationalization the readiness and preparedness is one of the key challenge that we have had in the uh, previous slide uh, in the previous question that we discussed quite extensively. Um, how we are ready is when we are able to learn the technologies quickly. So when the pandemic hits, I think everyone was not ready and quickly we have to adapt to the new normal. And this is how we know that the university is ready to actually face uh, internationalization regardless of the situation. Um, the digital literacy is something that was also inculcated. Uh, it was also encouraged for students and staff and the whole community of the university to be more digital literate. So we need to unlearn and relearn new things um, to actually deal in the new age uh, that we are talking about. Not only internationalization, but also new age. Next, the development of interactive platform to allow um, us to be always resilient and interacting with each other. This is also uh, one of the key things to be ready for the university uh, to face internationalization. Training and development, this, is, this has to be continuous and especially now in this new age, uh, this is something that is very, very important. Effective communication between organizations. Uh, we also talk a little bit on top-down aspects where we are always guided by the top-down, particularly on policymakers. The ministry, the government is uh, always supportive um, when it comes to allowing the universities to work with internationalization. So effective commission has to happen not only within the organization, but inter-organization, intra and inter-organizations um, uh, effective communication. And finally, um, the readiness of the university to deal in the new age of internationalization is to enhance and nurture understanding and training. So just now we talk about top down, but this is more on bottom up. We have to be proactive now to be more uh, understanding, uh, to be more resilient towards the new age and hence can allow the internationalization to happen. All right. So the last question would be on the support. So we did um, a brainstorming, a quick brainstorming session. Um, one thing is because this is the last question and we were running out of time. So these are the keywords for the support that is required by universities, not only in ASEAN and Asia, but also the world. Funding is always the main support required. And then more training, national policy. This is usually supported by the ministries of higher education uh, abroad uh, and locally in Malaysia and abroad. Uh, sharing of best practices. So this is one thing very important that I see um, our group members talking about the ecosystem of internationalization. So JKPA was mentioned there. Uh, this is an example in Malaysia, we have a national committee where the international centers come together and meet. Uh, we do hope that other countries also have similar committees where we can finally exchange uh, knowledge and experience as well as best, best practices for the betterment of internationalization um, in the future. Uh, regardless whether it's an endemic period or when everything goes back to the old normal and if everything is um, okay now. And hence, the keyword finally for to sum up all this particular internationalization of the future from our group is to collaborate, collaborate, and collaborate and always keep in touch with each other. So with that, thank you very much. I hope that those points uh, discussed in our group has been beneficial to everyone also. Thank you very much. Back to you, Prof.
Assalamu alaikum. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Aizad. Uh, value your great facilitation job uh, all the way from USM. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got lots of insights there, but I have to move forward now to Associate Professor Dr. Fifi Hanizda Saikim from University of Malaysia Sabah. Yeah, so you're far away there, but we're here thank for the virtualness of this whole session. So, Dr. Fifi. Assalamualaikum and very good, af uh, good afternoon. Good morning. We're still morning. <laughs> okay, so maybe I would like to uh, Miss Adera to help me to, you know, uh, share the slide. Um, I, uh, apparently I can't share this slide here. Because oh, cannot? I don't, yeah. Oh, I see. Never mind. Let me share. Let me save it. Can you try doing it now, uh, Miss Adira? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, still disabled. Okay. But, okay. So let me yeah. share my slide. Oh, yeah. Okay. I share my slide. Thank you. Okay. So can everyone see my slide? Yes. Okay. Okay. Today, I would like to share with everyone what we, our group, group two, have already uh, discussed just now. It's a very quick discussion, but very fruitful. You can, you can see how the words, you can see how fruitful our discussion is <laughs> now. So, um, the first question is, how ready is your universities in dealing with this new age of internalization? So, when we ask about how ready is your universities, so every university is that in my group, whether it's from Thailand, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Japan, they all are ready. Okay, they are ready to face the new age of internalizations. Because, um, for example, like the Philippines, they have already establishments of the international office with assistance with their international um, students club. Where now we are thinking because previously. Uh, when we talk about internalizations, all work must come from the international office. But in this new age of internalization, everyone has a role to play. So even students has the role to play in the international office. So they are, are working together, side by side together in this new age of internalizations. And then... Um, ready or not, universities must be ready in dealing and tackling new challenges in, in this post-COVID or in this new age of internalizations. Um, because maybe some of them are just adjusting, ad ad trying to adapt to this new age of internalization, but everyone is ready. So everyone uh, will be ready as quick as possible to adapt with this new age of internalization. And then the fourth one, encourage faculties to reach out, collaborate with overseas partner in specific study program. Definitely, how ready they are, they shows with a list of a few uh, international networking collaborations with new partners, opportunities to collaborate with new partners, new collaborations, not only in terms of uh, new universities, but also st new stakeholders, new industries. So inclusive internalizations, internalization for all, so everyone are not uh, excluded in this new age of internalization. So everyone um, play a role, everyone has their part, everyone has the opportunity, the same op opportunity in this new age of internalizations. Um, when we talk about what are the challenges that you face in planning towards the future of internalizations at your universities, of course, the first challenge uh, mentioned is the credit transfer recognitions at home universities. Because nowadays we have virtual mobility, blended mobility, no credit transfer. In fact, we have even no credit mobility. And then um, previously, in the, when, when we do uh, physical mobility, uh, usually we have three credit, uh, credit hours for one course, but now suddenly become one credit hours. So that's a bit quite challenging, you know, on how to credit transfers. Uh, and then different academic calendars, different timeline. So for example, Malaysia starts its new, new calendar in September, and then suddenly the, the rest of the world is not the same. So we have problems in terms of different academic calendars. Type. Digital gaps, academicians, students, university staffs, everyone, yes, we are in the in the era of gener generation Z, but not all generation Z is gadget savvy. You know, they are still what we call it um, digital poverty. 
Okay, digital property here is meaning not that uh, everyone doesn't have the gadget. Everyone do have the gadget, but the the knowledge of the, the, the technology is limited. Okay, not everyone, especially with, you know, the old, old professor. Sorry, professor. Okay, <laughs> the old, old, the otai, otai one, the old one, the seniors, you need to, you know, to upgrade yourself. So it's quite a challenging for them. Okay, and then um, challenges to introduce cultural exchange experience for the incoming exchange student. This is basically an important message mentioned by our student representative in our group too, because she said that um, they are also the first time experiencing virtual mobility or blended mobility. So when they are assigned to assist the virtual mobility to do registration and all, they have having problems as well because that was their first experience to deal with virtual mobility. So they are in terms of you know, um, gaps there. In fact, to exchange cultural via virtual also having problem. Lah. And then technical barrier, lack of internet accessibility, connectivity for students, especially those in the rural area, remote rural area. Adaptations to new policies. So we are living in an agile world where everything is keep on changing very quick. So, so does the, the, the policies. So the policies keep on changing while they are accepting and trying to adapt this new policy, a new new policy is coming in. So there's a bunch of new policies that are um, quite stressful and quite um, hard to uh, follow. Lah. And then the understaff at international office, uh, this is not only happening in the Philippines or in any other part of the world, but also in Malaysia, especially in UMS also, we are, we are also understaffed. So so under staff to, to help to plan in moving forward um, to the internalizations of the universities. And then the, uh, the eight, lack of support from faculties due to heavy workload. Um, because majority of our um, academic staffs are the one who actually was also working as an international officers in the international office. So the workload is that everyone is burnt out because of one under staff and then a lot of things, a lot of work. So workload very heavy so uh, definitely there's a lack of support lah when when dealing with this uh, new age of style of mobility in the uh, agile world and then the third question is what are the support required by your university to promote internalization during the endemic period and beyond the first word with capital letters funding if you got funding everything can go Okay, all the problems, all the issues solved if you have funding. Okay, so funding is the major problems. Lah. Not only, uh, you know, uh, in terms of um, virtual mobility, because virtual mobility also, we, they need some funding in terms of, you know, internet connection, some etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a lot of funding, uh, you know, play around in that, in that, in that, um, new age of internization. Support from the ministers. Ministers need to support, needs to listen more, need to look back at what is happening um, with the, in our internization um, uh, issues, especially uh, when, when we have problems in terms of connectivity. So the ministers should listen and do something. If that area doesn't have connection, so the minister should go down and you know provide the connection for the students and for the faculty staffs and more. And of course, more staff because majority of, of our uh, participant in group two, we are under staff, okay? More staff can solve a lot of problem, can ease the burden, we can share everything together. Lah. And then different way of thinking, new mindsets to move forward because now it's kind of like an, um, a suddenly we have COVID. So everyone suddenly have to change from normal to new normal. And I don't know whether they're going back to all normal, but mindset need to be changed, not only for the faculty staff, but also the students, okay? Because if the mindset of the faculty staff of the university's people and the students doesn't change, doesn't want to adapt to this new normal, we cannot move forward. We cannot move, um, uh, get this internalization movements going on. And then we cannot move forward. Uh, keep on saying move forward. Pula. And then is the policy on travel. We need more, you know, um, easy policies, green land. Okay, so that uh, we can help and support our students like, and our faculties. And I think that's all from, from our group. Thank you very much. Sorry if I'm, I've, I've, you know, 
miss out anything lah any info, important i guess i covered it all thank you thank you dr fifi for group 2 always amazing always uh chirpy and excited and we thank you for that now we're going to the third one um yeah funding is a popular word today yeah as i say dr tanoy i bet funding is also in part of your uh discussion uh but yes uh, over to you but before that in the chat room the secretary will be posting the link for the certificate and also a short uh, survey form for you to fill in to get a certificate for today's event um please do so please register from the list and now i'll pass over to dr tanot we might overrun by a few minutes i hope for less than 5 minutes dr tanot thank you thank you dr latif for that daily and the staff is will share our screen you know in our group we have um quite a lengthy discussion just like the others here 30 minutes is just too short for us and the first let me you know bring you to our discussions uh the first one is how ready is your university in dealing with this new age of internationalizations we begin with a university that already started with collaborating because it is we see the facets of um dealing with interna- internationalizations not just inside but also outside so there's two two way to say it either within your university outside of university or how you move forward from that so University in Philippines had they already started collaborating and creating road mapping about uh, what's next to do in internationalizations by putting out three to five years kind of program or what to do next because it been done within the university itself and to add a part uh, in Malaysia they started to work by starting to push students to go for mobility particularly for credit transfer uh, among the students so that. they not that just doing this um mobility or any program for interna- internationalizations but also contribute to their to their studies as well and there's a lot of work uh collaborating or very specific on just equal to funding yeah but we put it in a different way we collaborating with uh university with funding either from abroad or within the country or across the region so therefore we can overcome this uh challenge in funding uh, the preparedness in that is more like a, you know we deal with it partnering with people or see uh, working with collaborated partner who have funding to to go with and also uh, create a series of um, more like event or more like a platform for student to go abroad you know sometime we just consider what is this things what we have done throughout the pandemic but i think we have to create more programs uh for students to go abroad so that they are more um have more opportunity to go to do so and also this is the case in uh japan because there's a lot of students outbound but there's not many students inbound so uh because the needs of um it's not answering to the needs of current inbound students so there's also a great demand for inbound student to come to the country uh, to the to the japan japanese university it's not just yours but also to the malaysians as well so we see that there's a need to create the demands for inbound uh, how your the the classes over or the program the transfer credit or numerous other aspects of internationalization is answering to the needs of the students and university in the future and that's also the last one also include you have to join membership of new international associations to be part of it yeah and the outside of our university we have to you know not just collaborating but looking at partnering through joining memberships um uh, international associations and also within the country uh there's also uh words of compliance to high institutions commissions within the country that's very crucial as well despite we want to do much to do with internationalizations we also have to look in within us do we comply to it or not oh that brought us to the second questions which is um what are the challenges that we face throughout uh you know planning toward the futures of internationalizations at our university yes definitely funding is one of those um and then uh, how to do the mobility or exchange program or much more how to bring the students toward the internationalizations because we need lots of funding on that 
And that's also, this is much deeper to it when you, even if you have funding and having this a uh, lots of virtual program, there's a student who want to do, uh, you know, flexibility, the working while continuing their study while attending the virtual, you know, study. So we give several example of this uh, from us, for example, a student from France who did a uh, um, virtual attachment with a Jap Japanese university. And then uh, also the Malaysian students who would like to work at the same time while taking the classes because it's virtual learning. So at present, um, because the undergraduate programs, we, we find there's inflexibility in that because of your program, but also how can the university accommodate these kind of things? That, that's a real challenge for us because when the students did exchange program, there would to be the students of that exchange university instead of the present. So, but at present, they can do both. So it should be a plus, but then that's also a challenge for, for university because we need to have a proper um, a guideline for, uh, for internationalization. So that brought us to the third idea is here, credit transfer can be difficult or implemented due to curriculum policies of the undergraduate programs of the university. Or that, that have been highlighted because we have um, participants from uh, health sciences, which they have to have a mix of physical and um, virtual. So you have to do a mix of it. So some transfer credit cannot be done uh, because they have to do both or only half of it or how they can, you know, how to put it together so that a real problem. Now, what, what is the real equations for this uh, transfer credit that we have for subject matters? And one of our students brought up this um, internationalization in the future is that language barrier, uh, because not all country that you go to uh, speak English and some of the country, particularly if you go to university, is slightly remote area, they would prefer to speak their own language. So your language, uh, although people speak of it as global, like, global language, still not spoken by the others. So some students have this as a challenge, but uh, part of their challenge in the future. So this is, we pose this as our challenge. So to answer it, we, we bring it to question number three, <laughs> okay. Um, what support, you know, thanks to previous speakers, previous presenter, because you have mentioned a lot about it, and we just bring in a few uh, of our ideas on this, what support we, we, we require during the pan, during this um, pandemics and beyond. There's a lot of support, but here what we need the most is the right policy for the internationalization for the future, so that we can move from, uh, you know, there's a several challenges that we have to overcome from credit transfer, from people who want to work, and then we have a right policy to that. It is very important so that the students who are not doing their work or their study or their uh, engagement in vain, because if they're not be able to do so, they will not be able to complete their studies, et cetera. Despite it give a great um, advantage in terms of- um, Sorry. Yes, <laughs> culture culture, uh, intelligence, but there's a uh, limit to it. So the right policies by the governments, by the by the university are very important. And as mentioned, Sala, institutional support is very important. You know, it's not just understaffed or mainly understaffed because during pandemics, a lot of, um, we, we have moved to different kind of way of doing internationalization. So we need people to be trained in it. So that's speak of, um, Num number three, the number three, the hu human resource, because we need people to have this, uh, we have to train more people in the next uh, internalizations. If we look at a uh, presentation by Professor uh, Keiko, we realize that not many staff be able to do that. We have to partnering with various uh, faculties to do so. And I would like to speak the for the, Second point, uh, mechanisms such as uh, for funding, because we speak a lot about funding, we're often looking out for funding, but what about creating a, a mechanism or in, in, in incentivize way of finding uh, 
support finding or investments where the university or from various groups so that they can support internalizations of the university itself or our, our regions. So it could be from private public se sectors or even the alumni of the university. So that's from group number three. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Back to you, Dr. Latif. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarun Unja. Uh, <coughs> well, great insights. Funding is a key issue, support, capacity building training, um, you know, re-strategizing, looking through our partnership. Um, uh, who we partner with is also important. What are the activities that will take place? The changes that will take place are also very key features in all this. Thank you everyone for being here for this over three hours and 15 minutes of session. Um, I would like to thank every one of you who are here today. Just a reminder, the link for the certificates is already in the chat room. Please fill it in and you will get the certificate very, very um, fast, instantly almost. Um, I would like to firstly say thank you to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mohamed Ikwan Toriman, and also our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International Affairs, Professor Mohamed Kasim, for uh, the support that they've given us in organizing this event. Also to Toshiba International Foundation for providing us an interesting UKM Global and also University of Bangsa and Malaysia with uh, the funds to actually organize uh, a series of webinars with regards to internationalization between Japan and Malaysia. We want to say thank you to the Faculty of Medicine UKM for hosting our Zoom session today, to our JKPA members, our um, uh, representative of International Relations Office in Malaysia, colleagues and friends from across ASEAN, across the world, thank you for our partners who have been assisting us throughout these days. Thank you to the student ambassadors um, who are also here today to participate and give insights with regards to the uh, with regards to the internationalization of the future. Thank you to the facilitators, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Fifi, Mr. Aizat, and also Dr. Tano again. Thank you to our key four key speakers today, Professor Hiroshi Ota, Professor Keiko Ikeda, Professor Akiyoshi Yonizawa, and Professor Nakao no Nomura for all the insights uh, that they've shared with us, opening our eyes to new opportunities. Um, lastly, I would definitely like to thank the UKM Global Team, the International Relations Center of University of Kabangsa and Malaysia, uh, Dr. Tanu Unja, Mr. Haikal, Dr. Faiz, Dr. Mazlan, uh, Mr. Hafiz, uh, Ms. Adira, Shafira, Azwin, Salwa, Azlin, Habib, and all the team members. We've been doing this for a couple of months now, uh, and we've actually completed having six webinars and also one workshop session. And we are deeply honored and happy to have all of you to organize this um, forum or webinar platform for all of, all of you to discuss about internationalization. We hope to see you in the future for other activities as well. I wish you all the best and thank you once again for all your input. Thank you so much and hope to see all of you soon. Thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Bye -bye. thank, thank you, you. you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Latif. Thank you. Thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Latif. Thank you, Thank you. Bye, everyone. 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 B